Hello and welcome to Psychedelic Variety, a portal into a wide spectrum of offerings from our local and global community. We are the San Francisco Psychedelic Society, an evolutionary healing community empowering psychedelic culture through accessible education, integration, and connection. This podcast and all of the offerings we create are made possible by people like you. Grow with us in our healing community by liking, commenting on, and sharing this video, subscribing to our channel, and joining our events, which can be found on psychedelicsocietysf.org. If you believe in the empowering work that we do and want to share support or get more deeply involved, please make an in-kind donation or become a member at our website. The links can be found in the description of this video. Members of our organization receive discounts on events, private members' gatherings, and more as time goes on. And finally, we are excited to bring our community a high-level and accessible course on microdosing. It will take you from curious to confident with leading voices in the field James Fadiman, the Microdosing Institute of Holland, and Flow State Micro, a combined 30 years of experience to provide over 20 hours of content, 100 infographic slides, a microdosing journal, and ongoing community support through weekly Zoom calls and an online chat group on Discord. Enjoy this podcast and evolve with us. Psychedelic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All donations are tax deductible. Thank you. So, uh, Izzy, Danielle, hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all for the first episode of our Psychedelic Variety Show. It's an honor. Thank you so much, Izzy. Welcome back to the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. I'm so excited to be here. This is such a blast. What a good opportunity. And I'm so glad to be like launching this new variety show with you. It's a variety show. What does that even mean? Just means we don't have a lot of uh, boundaries. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, okay. Like if we wanted to do an interview with somebody one day and then the next day we wanted to do like a breath work free class or something like it falls into variety. You know, Perfect. it's in the category of variety. Perfect. Okay, that's awesome. I'm so excited. Yeah, we don't want to put ourselves in a box. We want to keep it a rainbow totally. spectrum, totally. just like your earrings. Nice, thank you. Wait, are we doing a breathwork today? Uh, you know, I don't. I wasn't planning on it. Who knows? Wanna... It's a variety show. Yeah, okay, we could. Right. Well, I guess I'll just wait and see. <laughs> so, welcome, Izzy Ismail Ali from Maps. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you today. And the focus of today, we're really going to talk a lot about demystifying policy and advocacy within the drug policy realm. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation, Seth and Danielle. I'm super glad to be here. This is now the third year in a row that we've done an event together. Um, and I feel really excited. Now, hopefully this will allow me to demystify policy and advocacy a bit for myself because it's a pretty mystical process, so quite an esoteric realm to be in, but I think that's like, we're all a bit, a bit comfortable. So that might be a good thing. Absolutely. Um, really quick on the topic of advocacy, Daniel, I'm going to advocate for a mic being a little bit closer to your face if possible. Um, so like, Start off, I'm Izzy, for those that aren't familiar with you, can you just give us a little bit of a background on who are you, what brought you to this work and what keeps you continue to be inspired? Yeah. Good questions. I really appreciate you asking. Um, where to start? So yeah, for those who haven't met me before, uh, or who haven't seen me before, my name is Ismail Lodi Ali. Uh, I am currently serving in the role of Policy and Advocacy Council at the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. Uh, I wear quite a few different hats. I actually also am on the board of directors of the SAGE Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, psychedelic therapy clinic in Oakland and Berkeley, California. Uh, and I'm also a founding member or a founding board member of the Psychedelic Bar Association, which will be close to launching at the time that this goes live um, or that this goes public. And that's like the uh, bar being like lawyer stuff. Bar being like lawyer stuff, not like drinking stuff. Although, okay. you know, there's a lot of overlap and it kind of depends on who you ask. But um, yeah. admittedly, we're not, you know, we're definitely looking at kind of like the whole world of the legal infrastructure around what's going on with the field and just trying to serve legal professionals and the people that they serve, you know, the people that they're trying to help build some um, infrastructure for. So I play a lot of different roles. Uh, I was I'm actually born in California. I was born in Fresno, California. My parents are both immigrants. Uh, my dad was born in, in India and in Delhi and raised in Pakistan. My mom is from Colombia. They came to the U U.S. in 1986. Um, Did they meet before they came here? No, they, <laughs> they met at Fresno State. They actually met, my parents met at a... 
an international student Halloween party. Nice. So it was both of their first Halloween parties in like 86. And uh, they uh, met and actually it's quite a beautiful story. My mom uh, kind of taught my dad how to dance like salsa and merengue and like the Colombian dances. And my dad taught my mom how to dance like bunga and like the Pakistani dances. And when I grew up, I spent a lot of time with you know, my family, my close family here or here in California and in the Valley and also the kind of extended community family of like all these people from all these different countries and places that um, were really all into like food and community and dancing. So I have two younger brothers and my family and I grew up kind of really, in a, I would say, a celebratory kind of environment, like really yeah. thinking about what uh, what brings us together and, you know, food and dance being one of them. Uh, no alcohol. I grew up Muslim. So like we didn't have any alcohol at our parties. Um, at least we didn't officially have any alcohol at our parties <laughs> um, <laughs> on the slot. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, oh, and I just, you know, we, we like to joke that we would just, you know, eat good food and drink chai and let loose. And that was like a lot of my upbringing. Um, at the same time, you know, I was, I was, as I said, I was raised Muslim and like really politically socialized after nine 11, um, learned a lot about law, kind of the way that the world works following that event and how it, kind of forced me into a level of political socialization and awareness as a young Muslim. Um, I was really involved with kind of interfaith activities as a younger person, engaging uh, in dialogue between people of different faiths and different faith groups. Um, and... Can I just ask quickly, like, were, yeah. would you say you were, like, forced into that because of the, the new narrative around being Muslim? And, like, were you getting you know, harassed? Or was that more of, like, upon yourself you saw the need to do that work, like... Yeah, no, I was being harassed. <laughs> I, um, you know, I have a particularly like, uh, uh, like deep memory, I guess you could say. I was 14 years old after swim practice. Uh, so it was like me and some friends we were like literally eating ice cream at like an outdoor mall in Fresno. And I spent the, you know, and I, you know, we were there one afternoon and I was wearing a shirt that said like Muslim. It was like, I was like out there, right? Muslim <laughs> in super big letters. And I remember this elder man walking by and staring at me for a few minutes. And I was like, Hey, can I help you after like literally like a minute and a half of him just like staring there? It's like me and like a bunch of other 14 year olds, you know, we're kids. And then he like cussed me out. He like verbally assaulted me and was like, your people are killing my comrades Whoa. in Iraq. And at that point, my family and I had already been marching against the war, against the invasion of, of Iraq and Afghanistan for a couple of years. So like, I was like aware of like the dynamics that were going on, but I think for me, you know, as a young person, I wasn't really um, fully, uh, fully aware of like the implications of like my identity and the the things that kind of came with the political realities that were kind of emerging in the United States at that time. And um, shortly after that, I got much more kind of active in my community, like kind of started engaging a lot more with kind of the uh, community building, community uh, narrative around peace building within Fresno and outside. Mm -hmm. I actually received a death, a death threat sent to my high school after an article that I, that I was featured in, in the Fresno Bee for like being a, a, a face of, you know, young Muslims in the Valley. So, and, and would you like, I mean, that's an interesting detail that hasn't been touched on. I mean, right. Like the shirt Muslim, like you were really owning your, I was really owning it. And I think that part of what happened was like, I didn't really fully at the time, I feel like I didn't really fully understand it. Even though I had been studying Islamic studies, I had been like reading the Quran. I had been really involved in that way. Um, should I meet this? I mean, you can, yeah, go for it. I'll meet, I'll meet things. No, no worries. My bad. Yeah, no, you're good. We're learning. So you're like just really into being Muslim in like a I was way really into like, being you don't Muslim. Know what I'm about, like exactly. And you know, the narrative the narrative at the time was like radical Muslims like killing people and like yeah. blowing things up. So like the whole narrative around like suicide bombings and like how Islam was incompatible with the West and like all of these things were really like being, you know, churned out by like the American propaganda narrative. Yeah. Uh, in those like early 2000s. Uh, so I became really disillusioned, actually. I was really like, I became really angsty, as I like to say. Um, I kind of lost touch with what I felt was connecting to me, to my community, um, and started to get, you know, lost and kind of confused about what I represented, even though I was also studying and learning and, you know, engaging with speech and debate, really trying to like up my capacity as a person. Um, and then I ate mushrooms. Was this still in high school? This is still in high school. Yeah, I was 16 when I ate mushrooms for the first time. And actually the first time 
I don't think anyone knows the story yet. I'm not super public about it, but the first time I ate mushrooms, I actually also took an ecstasy ball at the same time. So was I was your first like, time with ecstasy? yeah, yeah, so both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had read, I had spent two years reading Arrowhead and I was like, this hippie flip thing sounds way cooler than just eating mushrooms or just taking MDMA. So I'm just going to like go for it. And I had that experience when I was 16 years old and you know, it's, interesting to see 15 years later almost like what ripple effect like a single experience can have but um you know the way i like to say it is that it really shifted my understanding from or my experience from being like kind of angst filled to being more curious Mm -hmm. and i think that fundamental shift like was pretty significant for the rest of my life and that's kind of like what started this whole thing um you know, flash forward almost 10 years, I had, you know, I went to undergrad and studied philosophy. Uh, I had a few really deep spiritual experiences. I went on pilgrimages, you know, in my early 20s, kind of transitioning out of like my late teen, I'm throwing raves for my friends identity to wait, this is kind of a spiritual path. Mm. Like maybe there's something deeper than that. Well, I just want to like, I've been seeing this come up so much, like, you know, especially with the clinical stuff, like is heal is fun healing? You know? It's a good question. And it's like, you know, maybe you were already on that path before you like decided you were, you know, I think, I think that's true. And I think <laughs> that, and to this day, I still really uh, feel like what we see as like being fun or just like recreational use. Like what is recreation? Like, what is it? What is that process? It's like having fun. Sure. But like, it's also like building joyful narratives out of the experiences that we have, which to me is a big part of making meaning out of life. Yeah. Um, so is, you know, it's certainly true that people can have, um, out, you know, uh, confusing or, or even re-traumatizing or difficult experiences when they're in kind of celebratory or recreational environments for sure, because, you know, the container isn't always properly set. For sure. And um, fun is a part of healing and joy is a part of healing. And I think that that is part of what I was seeking as a younger person, you know, discovered a little bit more of that, these other perspectives, uh, these other angles when I was in my early twenties and then ended up in law school, really trying to focus on at the time, both the war on drugs and kind of this arc of like international relations. Like, what does it mean that when something happens to the United States, we export our violence on the rest of the world? Like, Mm -hmm. why did that even, why why are we even at a point where we're, where we're, um, having to respond to all that? So I think like I spent a lot of time really engaging with those issues when I was in law school and kind of you know, worked at the ACLU of Northern California, working on bail reform and criminal justice reform related issues in 2015. And it was that fall that I met Natalie Ginsburg, who's currently the director of advocacy at MAPS, policy and advocacy at MAPS. And mm. when we met, we were like finishing each other's sentences. You know, this is late 2015. And I had really like come to the realization that like the psychedelic experience, you know, having had at this point 10 years of experiences in all these different contexts. Yeah. Um, was deeper than just like an individual healing process. I was like, whoa, there's something actually that like might be beyond that. Mm. So when I met Natalie and met someone else who was also talking about intergenerational healing or trauma healing in a really like deep multifaceted way and also talking about race and social justice and like all these other topics, I was like, wow, this is maybe, maybe this is the thing that I've been kind of like looking for. And by early 2016, I went with MAPS to the UN General Assembly special session on drugs, which mm-hmm. was the first session that the UN had had as a General Assembly since the late 90s. That's huge. And just for context, in the late 90s, the General Assembly of the UN decided that their slogan was a drug free world is possible or something like that. <laughs> I laugh because like, I it's, actually don't think that's possible. It's so far from possible. It's so far from possible. And even if it was possible, is that really what we want? Right. Why would we want that? <laughs> is that really what we want? Um, so for the last five years, I've been working with MAPS kind of in this role. Um, I am a lawyer, so I do some legal work, but you know, a lot of my, um, a lot of my uh, work is kind of a combination of like internal, so, you know, governance and uh, compliance and ethics and like stuff that kind of works in the, uh, is kind of based in like the organizational development space. And then the other big chunk of what I do is more outward facing, you know, educating, having conversations like these, advocating. Um, and, and lately, now that, you know, the field has blown up so much, uh, kind of bringing in some of the nuance and some of the more sticky issues that are kind of harder to talk about, you know? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about like the outward facing work that you've been doing recently. Can you speak to some of the projects that you've been focusing on? Mm -hmm. So in the last few months, I would say, uh, I've been spending a good amount of time Um, having conversations with advocates in a variety of states. So after 
Oregon's election or after the election in 2020 and Oregon passing, Oregon voters passing measure 109 and measure 110. Um, there has been a huge increase in interest in people around the country thinking about what's possible. I think that there were a lot of folks who prior to Oregon passing both 110 and 109 felt like, you know, even though after Michael Pollan's book, after, you know, all the documentaries that have come out, you know, Maps's research kind of really coming forward, all these other companies popping up, I think people weren't sure if that was, I think it wasn't clear that that wasn't just like a trend or a bubble. Um, and I think after, you know, Oregon voters showed with 58% of the vote that they wanted to decriminalize all drugs and 56% of the vote that they wanted to create a legal kind of regulated psilocybin services industry in Oregon, um, other people started paying attention, policymakers, advocates in other states. Um, and of course, there had been a lot of groundwork put, you know, um, both SPOR and Denver and Decrim Nature have, have been doing work at the kind of municipal level. Obviously, organizations like MAPS and others have been really working on like kind of shifting the federal conversation. So we have kind of this like multi-pronged thing that's happening within the field. Um, and a lot of the time that we've been spending, or a good amount of time we've spent over the last few months has been engaging with some of these like advocates in various states, um, you know, Hawaii, Florida, Massachusetts, there's a handful of other ones that are all thinking, well, how do we take this next step in dismantling the war on drugs? You know, we a lot of states were now at a critical mass within the U.S. around uh, adult use of cannabis. We're at a critical mass around um, the way that we think about, I would say, drug policy broadly is starting to shift. Um, so that's been a big chunk of it. And, you know, specifically in focus, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about this today, uh, specifically thinking about um, the work that's happening in California and the bill that Senator Wiener introduced uh, earlier this year that is, you know, moving toward decriminalizing psychedelics in the state of California and like thinking about not just, oh, what's the specific goal that we have? How do we get to that goal? But realizing that we're actually needing to zoom out and look at a landscape and be like, actually, a lot of things are moving at the same time. Um how do we get to the point that we want to get to? And what is that point? Like, what, what are we actually going for? You know, we're not really like playing in this realm where it's like, there's a handful of small specific um, topics or things that we're trying to change. We're now able to look more broadly at the entire war on drugs, at the entire drug control mechanism. And it's not just happening in the US, it's happening globally. Yeah. So now it's like, we've got this like patchwork of policies that are starting to emerge. And I feel like a lot of the role that MAPS plays from a policy perspective, of course, in addition to the work that we're doing, you know, developing MDMA into a medicine is about helping support some level of cohesion among the different kinds of advocates. And um, that's hard to do. People have different perspectives. And I liked, you know, I, I've noticed and I actually felt a lot of glee last year. I was like, wow, we've had a lot of policy disagreements in the field now, <laughs> right. which to me is a sign that there's maturity within the field, that there's now you know, reasonable people disagree about different ways to do things. And yeah. yes, it brings tension forward. And I think it's pretty awesome because yeah, it means that we can think means stuff. like there's friction to like, you know, rub away the the like jagged edges, you know, exactly. to learn about what's the essential stuff in the center. Of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I would say that that's a lot of it. And related to that is like, how, like, you know, I, I, you know, I went to law school really wanting to understand this like system that works and, Frankly, I went to law school to understand the system of oppression because the law is used to oppress in many cases. And it's also used to create structure, um, including containers for other possibilities, not just for, for violence and pain and oppression, but also for um, healing and justice and other factors. So I think that like um, thinking, like looking through, looking through the lens of like what's possible and looking beyond just like legal change, but also like what are the cultural keys and cultural things that need to be in place to for this to happen responsibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For those that are new to this new bill that's being introduced in California, can you speak to just a high level overview of what that is and some of the nuances that you took part in implicating in that? Definitely. Yeah. So um, Senator Weiner, Senator Scott Weiner uh, in the Senate in California um, introduced SB 519. Uh, which is a bill that at its core decriminalizes the personal use and possession of a number of psychedelic substances. I think the list is psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, ketamine, DMT, ibogaine, and mescaline, not from peyote. So mescaline that's derived from sources that aren't peyote. And we yeah. can go into the whole peyote conversation in a yeah. bit because it's, we'll yeah. it's quite a rabbit hole. And what about 5-MeO-DMT? Um, so we, our theory right now is that 5-MeO-DMT, which is not specifically controlled under California law, falls under the DMT prohibition. So we think that if uh, DMT is covered, then 
of MEO DMT would be included within that decriminalization. And obviously, ayahuasca would also be considered with that because the reason ayahuasca is controlled is because of its uh, because it has DMT in it, not because of its own sake. Because yeah, the copy button, that's fine, right? It's the leaves. Right? Exactly, exactly. It's a DMT containing leaves. Um, then it's probably not even having the leaves. It's probably the processing the leaves. That's... Yeah, I mean, like generally speaking, most people believe and agree that you can, you know, grow plants that may contain psychoactive substances. You mm-hmm. know, there's again a reason why people disagree about like what that looks yeah. like, but generally speaking, uh, many people believe that just growing them for the sake of growing them is fine. Um, the question is, once you start refining and processing and then like intending to use it or intending to give it to someone, that's when it starts to get sticky. Yeah. So part of the goal is to make it so people could theoretically process these substances themselves, like with plants that they grow or with substances that they find. Um, and the other thing that I'm really excited about that SB 519 does is it actually decriminalizes um, all paraphernalia for yes. these substances, which means that uh, drug checking, substance analysis, mm-hmm. um, other kinds of like safety mechanisms, harm reduction mechanisms are actually possible. Um, and to us, you know, thinking of, from a big public health and public safety perspective, find that to be really important, knowing that we have adulterated drugs, knowing that the sourcing of a lot of these substances is difficult to um, to do safely and hoping that kind of like that's one of the ways that we can kind of build a culture of better safety within the field. And lastly, I'll say it also expunges the records of people who've been, um, you know, busted for personal possession and use of these substances in the past. Um, which, you know, from a numbers perspective is probably not a huge population. Like the number of people who are arrested for cannabis or heroin or cocaine or yeah. methamphetamine is way higher. Um, but it's still significant. I think it shows good precedent because precedent. we actually do want, exactly, we actually do want, when we do go for all drug decrim, which I think is a major goal of MAPS and of the field as a whole, um, to make sure that expungement is part of that. Yeah. yeah. So I actually want to expand on this before we get, I think we're getting a little more specific on things, but to even go bigger real, real quick is like, you know, SB 519, from everything that I remember that we went through with the decrim stuff here and, and decrim uh, nature here, there's a lot of talk about, okay, well, you know, you guys are going to ruin the hopes that we have for all drug decrim. And I, I'm glad that you said that, but I also wanted to ask, you know, SB 519, it's not a destination, it's a step. Mm-hmm. And like, do you, are you able to share any more about that bigger roadmap that you guys are looking at and what other steps might be on it and what the, you know, assumed destination of this time might be? Totally. We were really worried about this. And actually, we had to make a pretty tough strategic choice at the beginning of this when we were, you know, we were reached out to by Senator Reno's office in November of 2020. Mm -hmm. And we had to discuss, we were like, okay, well, we've been saying for years that our policy goals include all drug decriminalization. Um, We do have real concerns that doing, you know, a few drugs at a time or saying, oh, these drugs are okay, but these drugs aren't like could lead to kind of a messaging um, discrepancy down the line. Where we're like, oh, if we want to just, you know, decriminalize these other drugs that actually are the source of most arrests and are the source of a lot of public health concerns, um, we didn't want to create some like weird dichotomy where like these drugs were okay, we should decriminalize them. Yeah. Drugs so we were really thinking about that. And at the end of the day, we made the decision to participate in this process partially because mm-hmm. we figured there were two options. Either we could say, you know what, stay with our principles. We're going to be um, in. We're, we're only going to work on this if it works toward all drug decrim. Um, or we can participate in this process, limited as it may be, you know, and flawed as it may end up being, uh, but do so in a way that brings in as much as we can to set groundwork for all drug decrim. That's why actually, yeah. like, you know, these look to what you're what you're asking, Danielle. That's why we really push for making sure paraphernalia was included. Mm-hmm. That's why we push to make sure that expungement was included, because these are both things that are part of like the precedent that we want to see for a larger drug decrim. Now, I do think that the concern you're talking about is still there. Like, I think that from a messaging perspective, we actually do need to think very carefully about why we're advocating for SB 519 to pass. And it's not just because these substances are maybe good for us or maybe have some therapeutic value or have studies that show some sort of benefit. I actually think that we we need to keep the conversation focused on on decriminalization for its own sake because criminalizing people for what they put in their bodies is wrong. Mm -hmm. It is true that there's some more evidence for some of these substances that they have some sort of therapeutic value. But it's easy to, and I think often inappropriate to conflate like, oh, the therapeutic value with like why we should decriminalize them. Yeah. It's actually just wrong that they're criminalized, period. Right. Um, the fact that there is also a therapeutic value, I think, is a really beautiful plus and something that we should continue to <laughs> study and to study to create. But the reality is that a lot of those benefits do occur in more regulated, but certainly more contained contexts. And that's, I think, where we want to build a culture where people can create those containers for each other in a safer way instead of having to do it like by themselves or kind of always in fear of arrest or some sort of stigma. And now that the focus is on just decriminalizing psychedelics, do you think that will put more pressure or more of like 
pressure from the police to focus more on the other drugs that aren't included in this? That's a really good question. We one of the one of the other reasons actually we said yes to really wanting to participate and support this bill is because we got repeated uh, promises and you know uh, uh, kind of uh, statements from Senator Weiner that he and that he would be working toward all drug decrim later down the line. Um, and that's a good question. I mean, the reality is that right now there are already task forces in the state of California that are extremely well funded to go after drugs like meth and fentanyl and heroin and all these other things. So um, as we move toward kind of the post prohibition paradigm slowly, one step at a time, I do worry that, you know, funding for drug enforcement might be shift shifted around in a way that we, you know, that ends up harming other people more. Um, and the reality is that right now there isn't a huge amount of money that's being put toward enforcement of these substances. That's one of the reasons I think the decrim nature movement is so successful. They're actually they're asking you know cities to put to stop putting resources towards something that they're already not putting resources towards. So right. they change almost perfect. nothing. Excellent. That exactly. You're cities gonna love like, us. Perfect. <laughs> like, that's exactly what we're hoping for. Yeah. So, but but it does have an impact because it, it does allow people to have more honest conversations, more open conversations to feel safer to be bringing this stuff forward. Mm -hmm. So it's a cultural shift, I think, almost. More exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And the cultural communication shift, I think, is a big part of like what we what we're going for. Yeah, as well. And with all the precedents as well, you know, it's like really lining up that narrative for like, how do we do this step by step? I mean, yeah, that's great. And with one other thing about SB 519 is that like, I just do feel excited that it's a container, you know, it's a step, there's work to do, there's actually amendments that we're pushing for, there's things that we want to see change even within it. And um, I do think that it's kind of a cool opportunity for a lot of different groups in California to be kind of unified around something and to like, mm -hmm. engage with the nuance of what policy we actually want to see at the state level. Um, and that I think is a really cool opportunity because it actually gives us, you know, as a, as a movement, as a field, a little bit of space to put some of our differences aside and be like, we know that this is a good step. We know that there's more to go. Um, and kind of to your question around like what the next step is, I actually think that the big reason that going for all drug decrim in the state of California is difficult right now is because of the COVID funding freeze. In order to decriminalize all drugs responsibly, we can't just be like, there's no criminal penalties, period. What we want to do and what we say to do it responsibly is that we actually want to include uh, specific references and specific space to create harm reduction education, to mm -hmm. make sure that there's harm reduction services, that there's information about these substances being available, and for people who need it, access to treatment, access to non-coercive treatment. That's part of what Oregon did with Measure 110. Yeah. Um, so right now in California, it's really difficult to get anything passed that puts a lot of money toward like a new big, you know, fancy system. So we believe that we could kind of decriminalize this initial round of substances, um, talk about and bring forward space for honest education, bring forward some op opportunities for harm reduction, knowing that when we do go for all drug decrim down the line, that we're doing it in a really responsible way mm -hmm. that actually puts funding toward education so people within the state of California can learn about these substances. <laughs> no, maybe you shouldn't mix ketamine and alcohol. That's the thing that a lot of people don't know. Right, right. You know, and you that's a excited. huge thing. Get excited! Oh, this these drugs are legal now, right? Now we can just do all Woo! of them exactly. So, and, and, and for people that do actually need support, whether whether it's recovery support or otherwise, like we want there to be a place and options for people to get access to those resources. Yeah. And right now, the infrastructure within the state of California just does not set up to do that in a, in a at a mat and at a, at a scaled way. For sure. So we're kind of like hopefully spending the next two years, you know, working on SB five nineteen, hopefully getting this passed. And then really setting the groundwork. So when we do go for like removing criminal penalties for the possession and use of all drugs, we're not just throwing people to the wolves in a sense. We're saying, oh, and we have good education put forward. We have harm, permission for harm reduction for all these different orgs and yep. you know venues to include. And we also have like actual recovery services for people that need them. So that way we have a kind of wraparound services, full spectrum support for people instead of just being like, we're going to decriminalize all the drugs because we know that society needs a little bit more support than that. We yeah. sh we sure hope to be doing a lot of that education and harm reduction work. Totally. And I think groups like the SF Psychedelic Society and other psychedelic societies are really well poised to do it because you have built trust because you know what you're talking about. We care. It's <laughs> because we care. Uh, man. Yeah, I wanted to ask you kind of a weird question. Uh, 
while we're still on the topic, like, is there any concern that like by admitting to that bigger vision of decriminalizing all drugs that mm. you're like, oh, maybe people won't support this because they're afraid of that future. And then they'll think that this isn't even about psychedelics. It's going to be, it's a, it's, we're trying to co-opt their lives, but you know, we're trying to manipulate them. Or yeah. Like that. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about the internet, right? Like you can't really like, <laughs> like it's pretty like, yeah, there will definitely be groups who are going to be staying with a really close narrative and a yeah. really narrow narrative. And I think that's important for some groups to do that because that's, who they're supporting. One of the benefits I think um, I have about working at MAPS and around like the approach that MAPS has taken all along is that we're not just working for one kind of access for a certain kind of people. Like we actually believe that the entire fundamental structure of how we do drug control is flawed. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not saying that it should be a free for all, that there should be no rules about anything, that everyone should be whatever we should be selling MDMA at the gas, at the, at the gas station. Some people might believe that. I personally don't. It used to be salvia, so. You know. Right, it used to be salvia. They used to sell choice. salvia. Yeah. They used to sell salvia at gas stations. I don't know. When I was like, I think I had salvia like once in my life when I was like 17. And I was like, I can't believe that they allowed it. You know? It's just like, so, so yeah, I think that like we are, um, we, we don't hide our big picture vision. And we also try not to sensationalize it. We try to be honest. Like we know that there are risks to using these substances. Mm -hmm. we not, we're not like trying to glamorize anything. We're trying to say there is a different approach than criminalization that we should be thinking about. And maybe there's a few different approaches. And then again, on the big picture, like, you know, you're going to say, oh, well, it's going to cost a lot of money to create all these programs or whatever. But at, do you have any idea what the metrics are and how much money that might be saved by all the people that won't be in prison, all these other things? That is a good question. If we look at all drugs um, and we stop enforcing the personal use and possession of all drugs, the savings would definitely be in the millions of dollars. I don't know enough about the numbers to know exactly what they are. It's notoriously difficult to get arrest numbers in California, especially that are broken down at a granular level for which substances. Yeah. We've been looking for literally years to get specific breakdowns on how many people are arrested for which drugs in California, and it's very difficult. Um, so it's hard to predict. Okay. Um, but like you're you're on the right track. It's like, well, if we're saving all this money here, why don't we just put all that money toward educating people? Maybe that will even result in better outcomes. You know, well, it's and it'll probably be a lot less money because I think it's like fifty thousand dollars at least just to have an inmate. You know, just for, um, per year, just per yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. So I think like, you know, like just that one person not being in jail, how many people does that educate, you totally. know, something like that. So totally. I think it's like, you know, pretty, pretty big potential. Right. Anyway. So in terms of the future of SB 519 and the path that it's paving at the same time, there is decriminalized California that is creating this legal framework for psilocybin mushrooms. Um, are there plans? We all, we get this question frequently, like are there plans for SB 519 to eventually pave a path for legalization and regulation of these substances similar to what's happening with decrim California? It's a great question. Yes. SB 519, 519 currently, uh, includes the creation of a commission. I believe right now it will be situated within the California Department of Health. Um, at least that's how it's currently written into the law. Um, and that commission would be tasked with researching and looking at what possible regulatory systems could exist in California to create legal access to these substances. So I think that in the way that Measure 109 Oregon created uh, a, a panel that will spend the next two years reviewing a bunch of questions about training, about all these other pieces that will then be used to inform the implementation of the law starting in 2023. Um, we're kind of doing something with SB 119 that's a little bit in a different order in the sense that we're actually creating a panel to do review prior to even writing a bill about it. There will be a research process that would go through like what would be the most responsible way to regulate these substances? Is it through a therapeutic mechanism? Is not through an adult use mechanism? Maybe some substances need a certain kind of regulation, some substances need a different kind of regulation. So yeah, I do I do see like a big part of SB 519 uh, as creating kind of groundwork for that and doing the research so they can make recommendations to the state of California. What would be the right way to do this? What would be what would be a way that makes sense? Um, and I think that there are going to be a lot of different perspectives on how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, by the time this gets released, uh, we will have uh, published an analysis that we did on uh, what's going on in Oregon, which is kind of a combination of like, what does it mean to be creating a legal, legal system? And what are the things we need to watch out for and pay attention to when we create that system? Because uh, Oregon really started us off, I think, in a good way. And I think that we're going to have to iterate. You know, we're not going to get the, we're not going to get it perfectly right the first time. 
Um, and instead of kind of getting discouraged or losing sight of uh, the possibility of doing something differently than just medical access or just full decrim, thinking about something in the middle, um, we're going to have to iterate and kind of learn from our mistakes and really be humble about like what we think we know and what we're learning about the popular about you know the population in general of people that are interested in doing this. So yeah, the idea is to create some sort of um, research framework to get a sense of like what would what that regulated system would look like in the future. I love that. And I'm just curious, like, how does it feel from your perspective to see this other decrim measure happening that is actually creating that legal framework, but using that same word decriminalization? You know, this came up um, in the process of working on this bill, uh, partially because there is a bit of a semantic question here. Um, some people believe that the word when you're talking about totally removing, like 100 percent removing any penalty, civil or criminal, they would actually call that legalization. So if you look at the media around SB 519 when it first came out, there were a number of number of articles that said legalizes personal possession and use. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would argue that legalization is a term that's more accurate when applied to a regulatory system that actually yeah. creates some sort of system around sale and distribution. Um, when I'm thinking about just personal use, even though SB 519 would have no penalties for personal possession and use, whereas even, even 110 in Oregon still has like, I think a small admin, like a small um, fine. It's it's an it's in a it's a civil penalty that then can be waived if you have like a call with a recovery specialist or something along those lines. Um, so it, it goes a little bit further in that sense, um, and I think that it is it is semantic in the sense that you know people use different terms to to talk about different things. My personal approach is to me decriminalization is the reduction or removal of cr criminal penalties specifically yeah. legalization could include the removal of civil penalties so it could be decrim but still have civil penalties like a parking infraction mm -hmm. um but to me like i usually save the word legalization for a larger system so if what you know that effort is doing is creating a legally regulated system i would actually call that legalization i would call that legal access um and of course it's still limited because it's legal within the state it's not legal federally, so there's still going to be that conflict, but that's a whole other conversation. So I don't have the, the most nuanced perspective, but the way I would kind of look at it is like, you know, oak tree isn't legal. It's just like not against the law, like an oak tree, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and I think that that's kind of like how I look at, you know, where I would want to see like, or, you know, not that I have a crystal ball, but almost like how I would want to ideally mm -hmm. see mushrooms taken care of. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, this is just like not really... Uh, problem but then of course you know you i understand why you would have to like add laws and in my mind that's where it becomes like legalization if you know if it's a gray area we all have an opinion mm -hmm. like I, I just feel like you know what is one we can all like kind of rest on like you, once you start to add laws like about it how it's regulated yeah deborah peterson small at drug policy alliance conference in 2015 um said something that really resonated with me and has stuck with me since then which was we should legalize cannabis like we legalize like or we should we should regulate cannabis like we regulate tomatoes which yes. is to say you can grow them in your backyard. You can sell them at a farmer's market. You can share them with your friends. If you're going to create a business and start labeling them, then you probably have to, you know, apply regulations to your system because then you have a duty to your consumer. Mm -hmm. I think similarly, especially when we're talking about plants, and this is part of the reason we're really fighting for home grow within 519 for mushrooms specifically. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important that we really look at this line of like, well, what's like helpful decrim and what's like overregulation. Mm -hmm. um, and we do worry about overregulation because at the edge of regulation lies criminalization. Mm -hmm. So if you look at cannabis today, it's true that you have, you know, increased space for the legally regulated industry and people who fall outside of the industry may still be criminalized to some extent, if not from a business perspective, even from a criminal perspective. So I think that looking at the edges of these laws and like what we permit and what we don't permit, um, is a big question. And I think, you know, we can look at the example of Oregon again, where, you know, Measure 109 does decriminal or does legalize a system for use, but 109 does not decriminalize the use or the possession of mushrooms. 110 does. So in Oregon, you can possess up to 12 grams of mushrooms, but that's not enough for like a home grow. So in yeah. theory, in Oregon, you could go buy and use psilocybin in a legally regulated setting in two years, but you won't be able to grow it yourself. And that's the kind of thing that we're concerned about, where we want to make sure that if we're going to be moving toward legal regulation, mm -hmm. especially for certain substances, that people do have the autonomy to do that. It's hard to justify that for something like MDMA. I can see why people are worried about not having like chemistry labs in residential areas. This yeah. actually came up with um, concentrates with cannabis. Yeah. 
where it's like the regulation of labs is different. So when you're thinking about manufacturing something, um, the level of considerations increases. So I would say when it comes to synthetic substances, there's actually a deeper conversation that we do need to have about regulation because I, I don't think that um, people are comfortable with like, you know, full-fledged chemistry labs being in the apartment next door. And I right. think that there's good reason to think about, well, is it safe? How can we make sure that that's properly regulated? These are all questions I think we need to get into as we think about like legal legal sales or legal yeah. distribution. And I think you could look at like different phases of manufacture because I think we can all agree that, you know, the worst, you know, maybe the most hazardous thing about having a pot plant growing is just that, you know, you might have mold problems in your house totally. or that like, you know, the smell might attract criminals or something like that wants to rob you. And I think similarly for mushrooms, it's probably even a lot less. So there's obviously like cultivation, but then extraction and things like that. Totally. Kind of is a different, and even methods of extraction. Some are really safe. Some are really dangerous. You know, can you not like extract psilocybin in cold water? Is that, totally. that going to be regulated? You totally, know? totally. So, and I, th I think then there, you know, I'm thinking of it as like multiple tracks of things that are happening at the same time. So yeah. like, as we legalize or decriminalize or make behaviors more accessible and available and less criminalized, less stigmatized, we need to increase at the same rate the access to education and the access to harm reduction services. Yeah. So, and this is kind of what I was getting at earlier with like, how do we make sure that we're, we're matching the speed of growth uh, or the, I should say the speed of policy change with like the speed that society and culture is ready to grow and mature around what that use can look like. Um, in a kind of messed up way, uh, criminalization has deterred some people, you know, hasn't deterred lots of people from using the substances. I think that's yeah. a mistake to think <laughs> that really criminalization is effective that. deterrent. Exactly, it's really bad at that. Um, but it has deterred people from getting, you know, good education or being open about their discussion. They have to keep everything in, in the shadows underground, um, which has meant that, you know, without groups, I guess, of psychedelic society and other groups that are like really trying to put out education about these things, they have to look on the internet and hope that the website they find has good information. Right. It's um, mainly anecdotal. Overwhelmingly yeah. anecdotal. Yeah. And I think that like, that's part of the benefit of bringing this forward where it's like, it actually makes room for conversation because there will be people who do it wrong or people who do it in a way that's out of integrity. Um, so I do think it's like really critical that there's room for uh, these honest conversations to happen. And I think part of that is like actually just, you know, bringing light to what people are already doing. In terms of that, like the overwhelmingly anecdotal information out there when there is that legal framework paved do you think there's going to be regulation around who's doing the educational work like how do you how do you control that and make sure that that the right information is coming out i love this question it's been coming up a lot what is the line between advertising and regulation or and, and edu education what is the line between advertising and education I think that this question is going to come up a lot in the it's next few years. It's getting blurrier constantly. It's getting blurrier and blurrier. And, you know, you can look at how kind of modern marketing with other products, with normal products, started to change where, you know, marketing around like fair trade or marketing around like the sourcing of something is starting to get more visible and seen as more kind of like effective in bringing in consumers because consumers want to know that what they're getting is an ethical product, that they know where it's coming from and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm fascinated by this because I think that I do have a really big concern about, um, let's say we get to a point where we're dealing with legal legalization and commercial access. I really worried about, worry about like commercial, um, current kind of manipulative commercial methods, even if you look like targeted advertising or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, being applied to some of these substances, especially people who are very desperate. We know right. that a lot of these tech companies have psychological profiles of their users. We know that these tech companies can tell when their users are depressed. What happens when an unscrupulous company starts advertising on an unscrupulous platform and suddenly really vulnerable people are getting targeted ads for substances that, that will heal you. That will they, heal you. They will heal you. They will heal you. Exactly. So you will be like a god. And and that's what really freaks me out, actually, because I really think that having really responsible education is the only way around that. And I don't know if we can trust companies that have financial motivations to be doing that education. Now, that's obviously not always true. There's always going to be people that are like trying to do things in a good way. Yeah. And maybe, maybe there's a higher percentage of that within this field, but I wouldn't necessarily make that promise at this point. Um, it's too soon to say, because I mean, I think cannabis started off like when it started really coming out of the box is just like, yeah, it's all about healing. It's all about that. And I think we can see a lot of that getting co-opted right now. I heard mm -hmm. great culture from uh, Oye, Oye uh, last night, culture vultures. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, this is what's trending. Take exactly. that repackage it, attach my product, to commodify it. it. Exactly. Yeah. So, th so that, that is a big concern. And actually, like, just to go back to your early question, like, well, aren't you worried about, you know, 
this strategy and like or it'll be open about this strategy about one strategy kind of opening up to another like that's what we're saying we're saying like we do want legal regulation of these substances but we're not saying like but that should look like every other market. We're yes. saying, oh, but when we think about what legal regulation looks like, we're actually thinking about something different from how any other product is marketed and brought forward. Um, and that requires a transformation of the whole system, of the whole field. And how we do that, I don't exactly know. I think that we're going to be in this really deep iterative process with different organizations over the course of the next few years. How do we think about advertising? And like, like you asked, exactly, like who gets to decide what education is good and valid? Like That's a really big, important question. Um, and I don't have a good answer, but I think that having visibility and having more people willing to talk about and call out and bring forward kind of concerns and important factors about different conversations, um, I think that that is going to be, it's going to, it's going to make a difference in the sense that it'll at least make it easier for people to see like what's going on. I'll just give one example. Like one of the reasons I think like the Silk Road or any of these kind of dark web based um, drug sale platforms are actually in some ways have harm, harm reduction integrated into them is because you can have user reports. Like when yeah. you buy something on Amazon, for those of people who are still using Amazon, um, you know, like you can look at all these reviews and be like, you can compare things and be like, oh, this person's a good seller, this person's not. And it's not a perfect system. And there's plenty of problems with the way that like e-commerce in general kind of lands and operates. Um, and it's safer for people. It actually gives people a way to say like, oh, this person's legit and isn't going to do something that hurts me. Yeah. Which unfortunately can also get co-opted, right? Like, you know, Yelp has its whole own thing. Or Anyway, I'm not going to get into that, but it's like, yeah, it, it's better than where we're at now. And uh, I'd rather be working with those problems. It's so interesting just around, uh, I don't know, how, how these bigger how these bigger players, you know, we were trying, trying to talk about this a little before we got on, but the um, stakeholder is the issue, you know, that I see it. It's like, as a nonprofit, our legal stakeholders are the community. You know, if we dissolve our company, all of the money that has been, that sits in our account, things like that gets returned to the community in some capacity, like legally obliged. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to that educational conversation, yeah, that's kind of one of the things that, you know, I, I think about is like, mm -hmm. okay, what is your obligation? Mm -hmm. You know, what are you, what have you like, written on paper who are you responsible to who are you responsible to who are you accountable to yeah and and there's not a lot of ways to really guarantee that right it's like trust mm -hmm. trust isn't an easy thing to come by either mm -hmm. and it's an easy thing to uh appear that you like uh, kind of it's an easy thing to pretend that you have like that's the thing about effective marketing and branding is that it like it's built to kind of overcome our inner um kind of filters and um, capacities to make decisions for ourselves. And the good marketing is done to be like, to kind of get into our psychological selves. And you don't need to think about this. That. Yeah, exactly. Just do it. It's the right choice. And with psychedelics, like people need to think about it. <laughs> people yeah. need to think about it a lot and long and hard. And they need to do the, do the kind of reading and spend the time educating themselves on how to do it responsibly um, for themselves. It's like not even just like good for the field, but it's as individuals, you know, knowing how powerful the substances are. Like it's actually really important that people think about what they're ready for and what they're looking for before they go for, go for an experience. You know, some of us who started having these experiences when we were 16, like yeah. Yeah. I did a bunch of research, you know, like I did a bunch of research before and I wish I had better information then. And yeah. I, I think a lot about what I wish I had when I was a teenager, like what would it, what would it have been like to not be like feeling, to not feel like a criminal for like the first, you know, half of my teenage years and all of my twenties, I was like, what would it be like to not feel like I was breaking a law? And I was exploring myself and exploring my healing and exploring my consciousness um, in a way that could be like openly talked about and discussed instead of having to hide it and get in trouble for it and get arrested for it. And, yeah. I'm curious too, like just to that topic of, you know, regulation and dissemination of information with this new bill around um, SB 519, I imagine that's going to, you know, birth a whole new community and era of facilitators and, you know, what, what is the path for keeping people mm -hmm. safe in terms of you know harmful facilitators that might be present in the space? And like, how do we support our community going into this? This is a really good and really tough question. One of the things in SB 519 that's also included in the current version of the bill is social sharing, which is basically this concept that for individuals that are, you know, holding the personal use amount, let's say on behalf of other people, uh, that they are also not criminalized under this law. And it, you know, you're not allowed to commercially distribute. You're not still not allowed to sell sales and just sales will still not be permitted in that sense. Trafficking and distribution that's as well be permitted. But social sharing kind of creates a little bit of a safety bubble around people who are doing work 
um, on behalf of or with each other. Now, this is a really tough uh, needle to thread, thread to needle. Yeah, needle to thread. <laughs> yeah. Um, because exactly as you asked, like as soon as you create a room for people to create power dynamics, so facilitator and person following, the guide and the in the group, you know, like mm. uh, the ceremonial leader or all this stuff. Like at any time, you create a system that has an inherent power dynamic. The questions around accountability become much more important. So one thing that we're working on with this bill uh, is that right now it frames um, certain roles like spiritual guidance or kind of group counseling as permitted roles within social sharing that are allowed. I have some concerns about this because one of the things that we've noticed is that when you create a power dynamic where you have multiple layers. So you have someone whose role it is to like take care of, who has a duty of care of some kind to a person that's having an experience. Um, it's really difficult to capture exactly how significant of a power dynamic that creates. When it's your therapist, when it's like a doctor, when it's like a shaman, shamanic guide or whatever that is. Like, mm -hmm. um, So thinking about the responsibilities that those people have is really important. Within like larger regulated systems, whether through the FDA system or others, you know, you have board oversight, it's not perfect, but you have some sort of way to say, mm -hmm. oh, this practitioner is not cool. We need to like get rid of their license. We need to certify yeah. them, whatever. They're, they're accountable to somebody. They're accountable to somebody. They're accountable right. to some sort of entity that does that. Yeah. Um, so we are really concerned about creating these hierarchical systems without also creating systems of accountability. And for that reason, we're actually hoping and we're actually like working toward what would it mean to permit something like social sharing without naming specific roles? Because there's a lot of ways you can frame that. And those are relationships that can, and maybe in responsible cases, should be built among people and among groups and in relationship. But as soon as you create labels around them, you need to have some sort of oversight structure. And that is something that that would not be possible under just decrim. This is why we push for more regulation, because regulation would permit some sort of structure for some of that to occur. To answer your question, though, I think that there is a level of community accountability that can be built. Um, right now, you know, if you look at movements like Me Too, you think about whisper networks and kind of like um, like little black books where you have like places where, oh, practitioners who've acted out, act out of line, like, you know, you can write their names down, make sure people that people, people know that. You know, it's an interesting working in the underground where there's like a kind of don't snitch culture, right? Mm -hmm. And where you're like, well, the only accountability I have for someone who might have done something out of integrity is to take them to cops? Like, are we going to bust them? Are we busting everyone that they work with? You know? So right. I think, and it's a tough question because some people like act really poorly and really um, violently and abusively. And it is important to make sure that people who are in that position or who, who, who do those things aren't able to stay in that position to continue to you know, abuse or hurt other people. Um, and our only mechanism right now is law enforcement and incarceration and a lot of people also hold the value that that isn't actually a way to change behavior uh, and maybe take someone off the streets for a period of time if it even works but that doesn't always work either out of the retreat center yeah take them out of the retreat center like put them somewhere else well and also you have all the people that are kind of like essentially uh you know they were also doing something illegal right they were also participating exactly so, so like, people are worried because they're like well if i'm gonna out this person then suddenly i'm in trouble there's actually no safety for the accuser. Yeah. So it's true that there's there's no like safe harbor. There's no like good Samaritan version of this. And I think that that's the other reason why I think decriminalizing personal use could actually really help because then if someone is really being abusive, if something is going wrong, then those people maybe aren't as much risk when they're trying to like bring attention to these issues. Um, but it's complicated. It's like a lot of these things are much more difficult to navigate and to manage when they're underground yeah. and you know it's not that the above ground is a perfect job there's lots of people who are way out of integrity even in totally legal systems totally um sure. it's absolutely true it feels like the laws are built for those people imagine exactly so 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 that that's what i mean it's like we're not just trying to transform the field to bring these substances into the current mainstream we're actually trying to kind of meet somewhere that's actually beyond the current mainstream and the current prohibition pushing these and you know this is this is also a conversation about commercialization. Like, oh, you just want to answer these psychedelics into the current business structure. Well, it's like, well, some people want to do that. <laughs> but we're also thinking, well, is there a way that the way that we approach these substances can be done differently, even among those economic models that are flawed and also the ones that we're currently working with? Yeah, great. Good work. <laughs> Yeah, we What's up at a time? Yeah. we have frequently gotten, you know, had people come to the psychedelic society and report harmful facilitators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we we wish there was some type of counsel that we could report to. And what we just come back to is the most immediate solution that we can do is to train 
people how, what to look for in a facilitator. You know, what what is a way a facilitator is you know expected to show up totally. and hold space and like it, people have the agency to interview this facilitator and ask them as many questions as possible to really know you know what to look for and what would stand out as a red flag as a mm -hmm. way to say you know no this is not appropriate to work with you right right i mean that that really is it it's like i mean i wish that wasn't the only way but you're right like educating consumers as it's often called or educating people who are actually seeking educating seekers you might say like is definitely um, kind of maybe the main way or the most like viable way that we have right now. Um, it's certainly not perfect. And I think that eventually, you know, I would love to see in the next couple of years, like if we're going to be decriminalizing psychedelics in the state of California, it'd be really cool to see the state of California come out with an educational campaign that they can put on billboards and put like on bus stops and be like, this is what this does. And this is what these things mean. Or here's a place you can get more information about it. Yeah. Um, and that would include things like what you're talking about, which is like, how do you know that someone's safe to work with? How do you know that they're trained? You know, I've been thinking about a um, kind of like a graph where like the more basically like the more desperate or the more impacted a person is, the more marginalized they are, the more trauma they have, the more, um, you know, the, the, the more extreme any issues that they're dealing with are, the more likely it is that they need a stronger container and safer and higher quality and higher trained care. It's totally true that lots of teenagers and people in their early 20s like take psychedelics with their friends and they're fine. They have a good experience. They're healthy. Maybe even they grow from it. Um, as you start to look at people who have higher needs, who have like, who have histories of trauma or violence, who have, who are dealing with addiction or dependence, who have these other things, like they actually do need higher quality care. And that's why we think about like bringing in multiple layers of access for different kinds of people at different levels of safety and need. Yo, is this house shaking? Is that just me? Oh, there's like an earthquake. There might've been a large earthquake. Okay. There could also be people just above us. All right, sorry. Who knows though? <laughs> We're in the bay. We're getting this thing started going back and forth. Like, Whoa! Oh, is that, okay, I'm probably making it through. It's interesting that you said billboard. I'm honest. I'm surprised to hear you say that. And can you talk a little bit more about like what <laughs> you would just want to be on it, don't you? <laughs> so I know, Why would you be very uncomfortable to be on a billboard? I'll be honest. <laughs> Um, we'll put it this way. If we're going to be advertising, uh, if cannabis companies can advertise on billboards, I think the state of California can put up, you know, notices that if we decriminalize ketamine, don't mix it with alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. If we decriminalize Ibogaine, um, you should be aware of what happens, of what, how it works. <laughs> yeah. You, you should that. be aware of the risks, you know, the risk of like, you know, a lot of people don't know that like when people take Ibogaine for, you know, you, uh, addiction cessation or anything along those lines that it often resets people's tolerance. So people will go through an Ibogaine experience and then maybe they go through something that they probably integrate, they have more trauma. Um, it wasn't enough for what they needed to process. Um, they continue to use whatever drugs they were using before, their tolerance is wiped, and then they overdose because they think they can do the same amount before them to death. This happens for people also when they get incarcerated and come out after they've lost their tolerance. Um, people don't know some of those things. And I think like, it really is a duty of our, us, of our field, to be educating people about these things, um, to make sure that if people do decide to approach these substances, especially for those who are particularly desperate, mm -hmm. who, like I said, who have more need or who are in more vulnerable positions, um, we don't want to give them this false impression that these are like silver bullet drugs that will save their lives and save them just because they take them once. Like, it's not that simple. Yeah. Exactly. And, so, you know we need to stack these experiences with community, with support, with integration, with preparation. Exactly. Exactly. And that's still a front end too, because it's not really talking about where do these substances come from? You know, where does ayahuasca come from? Like what's, how sustainable is it? It's where does it come? You know, what is the process of getting it? And like, does that mean that we are, you know, there's no more native, uh, Iboga mm -hmm. or Ibogaine? Yeah, it's very, I think it's a bogus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just totally gone. It's been over harvested and poached, which we're already on the way there. Yeah, snoring desert toad, you mm -hmm. know, for five meo DMT, we're on the way there, and it's not even hit the mainstream really. Yeah, you know? exactly. But toads do produce thousands of eggs every year. I found out. Cool toads for days. Yeah. Well, <laughs> mushrooms produce uh, you know millions of spores, but uh, <laughs> they're not growing everywhere. You know? <laughs> No, but this is a, this is actually a really good point. And the other reason I think bringing up the conversation around legal regulation is specifically because of the sourcing concern. The thing about decriminalizing personal use possession is that it kind of requires us to stay in this kind of like legal fiction that if you have the substance on yourself, you're good. Mm -hmm. But the way it got to you is still not okay. Yeah. And part of the reason, you know, the social sharing kind of provision was brought in is because, you know, 
people don't walk around with like their their one ounce of ayahuasca in their pocket. You have facilitators whose duty it is to, is to take the legal risk to source yeah. the medicine. They hold it. They keep it in control to make sure that it's not being like diverted out to random people wherever. They hold it for their community. They are you know doling it out. It's 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 a it's a role. It's an important role that actually involves like accountability and care to their community. And they've got a whole community that they're working with. And something goes wrong, like you know, thing things are handled in that space sometimes at you know different levels of effectiveness. Yeah. But to this question, like how we actually source these substances is a huge question. And this is where I think the movement toward cultivating certain substances is really valuable because yes, we should be knowing how to do this. It's also part of this like bigger movement of moving back to kind of a more uh, naturalistic res- relationship and a more um, active relationship to the earth and to the things around us. And there's like a whole arc of conversation we can kind of go into there, but this move, it's like partially about self-responsibility. It's partially about um, uh, making sure that people actually are in relationship to whatever it is that they're doing. Um, We'll probably be sharing an info sheet for 519 that actually specifically says that if people are seeking Ibogaine, that they don't get it from Iboga, that they look for, for like Volcanga Africana or other kind of methods mm-hmm. that are easier to grow and easier to find and, and that don't have the same ecological impact. Not that they have no ecological impact, but they have yeah. less of one. Um, and this is exactly why uh, the conversation around peyote kind of really came up because people are like, well, if we decriminalize mescaline, won't that increase the risk of to peyote? Yeah. Um, and I think there's a reasonable concern there because a lot of people associate mescaline and peyote. Yeah, I didn't even want to. I didn't even want to mention baby in that list because, like, I've almost trained myself not to talk about it because it's like that's almost like bringing awareness to it. But if we're going to talk about it in the context of like really like the the issues, I think that we should really unpack the whole thing a little bit. If we have, do we want to commit to that? I do. I'm, do yeah, right. I'm super passionate about this. For those that are listening and new, can you give kind of an, an, another high level overview of why peyote and iboga weren't included in this and specifically go into um, what's happening within peyote and the different communities that are stakeholders within it? Yeah, I'll do my best. I'm not exactly an expert, although I've done a lot of work thinking about this over the last few years because it has been one of the most kind of like visible and intense and um, issues within the field and in some ways I think of it as a, a canary in the coal mine in the sense that like the issues that we talk about related to parity I think are actually quite relevant for almost all the plants yeah maybe less so for mushrooms because they're so easy to grow mushrooms yeah so sustainable totally super <laughs> sustainable but I think it's certainly true for um, for ayahuasca for iboga for other plant medicines that are harder to source and that aren't sourced here you know that it requires some sort of international element or travel to to occur so the thing about peyote that's really important to know is that the species is currently threatened, which means that although it's not technically on the endangered species list, um, not only are there have there been reports for many years that the amount of peyote in especially South Texas and parts of Mexico are declining, um, but right now much of the peyote that's in the United States is on private land, so it's difficult to access, and there's a lot of complications and politics around um, where the peyote currently grows and where it is. The reason this has come up so much in the last couple of years is because the Native American church and at least and a council of the Huidarica in Mexico have both stated explicitly not to include peyote um, within any efforts to decriminalize because of the fear that decriminalizing peyote would increase poaching because it would increase demand. Um, and it's interesting because there are different perspectives on the extent to which this has happened. Um, but one solution that has been put forward and part of the way that SB519 is approaching this question is by permitting access to mescaline from sources that aren't peyote. Mm-hmm. It's true that you can get mescaline from other substances, from the Peruvian torch, from San Pedro, from other cacti. And the idea is that if there is a way for people to get access to mescaline through these other sources, then they won't need to go for peyote. Um, the question that I probably won't get into today is around the cultivation of peyote because it's a very, very complicated political topic. And it's one that I frankly feel um, kind of out of my range in, in talking about. And I feel like that there are people um, within the Native American community, certainly the Native American church, certainly kind of um, authorities and groups of the Huerarica in Mexico, as well as others in the United States and around that have a lot of different perspectives on this. And I think that as we continue this conversation, it's really good for people that are interested, especially in sourcing mescaline or talking about peyote to really get educated on the issue, like spend time researching what these different entities and these different organizations have said. Kind of, It's important that we both form an opinion about what we think makes sense and also stand in solidarity with the Native American indigenous communities that have been working with this medicine, partially because 
it's also not like politically neutral. The, the fight to have access to parity for the Native American church in the United States was a hundred year long fight. If you just look at the legal part, yeah. you know, before that, there's even more. So I think thinking about the origins of some of these substances is really important because, um, and you know, the reason it, peyote was actually left off of the bill um, is because of this concern where if like, oh, if we create legal access to it, it takes literally, you know, a decade or more to grow. So what that could do is increase poaching from Texas to bring to California. Now, yeah. the, the reality is that, you know, uh, harvesting from Texas, taking across straight line, state lines, selling it, all that stuff would still be illegal and is still illegal. Um, and we know that, you know, right now, the way I see it is like peyote and mescaline about, from other sources are equally illegal. If they're both illegal in the same amount, then I can see why people are like, let's just go for the real thing. We're going to yeah, go for this thing. Yeah. So the way we think of it is that if you really lower the risk of getting access to, you know, a functionally similar substance through other routes that are much more sustainable, then actually it might help peyote by reducing the demand for the actual cact for the peyote cactus, which will allow time for the ecosystem in Texas and Mexico to start readjusting and for, and it allows time for the stakeholders involved with this Native Americans here, indigenous people in Mexico and so on to have a more ongoing dialogue with advocates instead of just kind of like assuming that we as American advocates know what's best for the medicine, you know? Yeah, that's the tough one. Cause like, you know, it might seem like in our heads or whatever, like, well, yeah, we need to keep that in the conversation and like move it forward as well because, you know, we don't want it to get left behind and while everything else is being legalized and like, you know, regulated and we're creating more protections for different things when needed actually that's just getting poached all hell and nobody even knows about it. Like, I think that that's from my, you know, like kind of whatever you call gringo perspective, like the problem, but talking to some people in on the inside, it's like the perspective is just so radically different from mm -hmm. the way my brain works and the way my narrative uh, understanding works that, you know, it's like they're communing with spirit and like, you know, getting, you know, that download, uh, you know, about what the right thing to do is. So it's like, obviously what I think, is completely irrelevant and i just think that that is like really important to remember and also how i interact with that energy is completely confusing to me you totally. know i just don't know how you know totally and i, I think that this is going to keep coming up this is what i mean by the cannery and the coal mine like we uh, also need to be talking about the fact that like you know a lot of the ayahuasca that comes into the united states comes from brazil and peru mm -hmm. some of it comes from hawaii especially the ayahuasca that comes into the west coast because there are you know there's ayahuasca growing in hawaii um, and th this is a complicated thing because like, you know, not everyone thinks that these medicines want to be inside of greenhouses, you know, not everyone is, is comfortable with that idea. Like maybe we should think about like, maybe there's a reason why they only grow in certain places. Maybe we should have some sort of, um, reciprocal exchange with the people that are engaging in that way. And I think that, like you said earlier, like there isn't, um, a lot of this conversation hasn't really hit like the mainstream mainstream yet. Sure. It's like on TV and there's documentaries about it and it's Netflix and so on. And like, you know, these numbers are changing, but um, we do, we are still in a little tiny bit of a bubble in the sense that there are still people who are still afraid. And I think that um, this is kind of what I was saying earlier. We want the speed at which these substances become more accessible to be in alignment with the speed at which we can actually sustain that, which includes education and harm reduction, like we were talking about earlier. And it also includes sourcing. Um, I don't know what it would mean to have to be like, you know, creating cultivated, mass harvested access to some of these medicines. Like that also yeah. kind of freaks me out. You know, I'm from the Central yeah. Valley in Fresno in California, where like industrial agriculture has totally, it, it's the way that it works. And, you know, on one hand, it's what, what is needed maybe because it's what provides all of these resources to people all over the world, all these food resources. And on the, and on the other, it's actually a symptom of like monocrop, yeah, it's, uh, like, po like post-industrial agriculture, that's also like terrible. Like, you know, the Central Valley is full of people with asthma because they have spent the last hundred years spraying pesticides into this bowl in the center of California so they can maintain a certain agricultural problem. Like, I would hate for ayahuasca to be subject to like the current industrial agriculture regime. Like that just literally order. gives me goosebumps. It freaks me out. Yeah. So it, that's not the answer either, right? There's like, and this is where I think we, this is where I think we can start thinking about the more visionary approaches. What do like community gardens look like? Like what do yeah. farmers markets look like? Like how can we do this on like a micro scale? So we don't get to this place where we're like, how do we provide the medicine to all the people who want it in some like totally ahistorical and like non-justified, non-reciprocal way? Well, I think you can create a lot of like problems because we want to be kind of 
both centralized and decentralized, right? You want to have like a lot of little centers so everybody has a, a, a community or they have the opportunity to be held and supported in a true like uh, a nest, you know, their psych their local psychedelic society, mm -hmm. you know, plug us, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, yeah, you don't want it to be like that access is, you know, you know, what is my access to like sweet potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it has nothing to do with where it's sweet potatoes come True. from. I don't know anybody in that pipeline is completely anonymous, really. Mm -hmm. You know, so like I would actually much rather, I love when I know the person who grew my food, you know, mm -hmm. I, I love that feeling. Yeah. And then how do you have the enough regulation to, so that those people aren't, aren't totally messing anything up. They're not spraying, you know, weird pesticides themselves because mm -hmm. it's not regulated mm -hmm. or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So what is that fine line? And I, I think that cottage industry scale is like really the, the path of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how all of this plays out, you know, especially with I've been hearing different voices in the community and hearing kind of some pushback towards um, you know, the feelings of the Native American church and the Wicatica mm -hmm. communities that have been you know, practicing working with this medicine for long time and you know, some individuals believe that we should include um, cultivation and that there's some type of monopoly being created on that cultivation mm -hmm. can you speak to a little bit um of like what you know about this and like what you would say to someone that has heard this information mm -hmm. yeah i don't know anything about like future commercial production personally um and i would never like put it out of the you know possibility because we're in the world that we live in um, and I do think that in, insofar as commercial sale were permitted, which again, with peyote and other substances, it's not, but insofar as there would be permission to do something like that in the future, I do think that any time for plants, especially any time that commercial sale is permitted, that home growth should also be allowed. Um, and I think that that is just a way that we maintain some level of control on like a runaway commercialized industry. <laughs> Um, I think that from a rationalist perspective, I can definitely see why cultivating any plant, including parity, makes sense. And I can see how from a perspective of both protecting the plant and thinking about um, how to avoid future monopolization from any entity, that that would be a way to protect it. And that's one of the reasons we push for like home grow mushrooms. Is so we don't have like one producer of like the right kind of psilocybin that's allowed to sell to everyone. And... Um, we live in a world where relationships matter and where, you know, there are people who have put in time and energy to build certain relationships and to navigate um, kind of politics in a certain way. And to, to the extent that that's true with the Native American church, with the Wiatic community, with Parody, with so on, with the Mestizos who've been using Parody also for, you know, a very long time um, throughout Texas and Mexico. Um, we can, I think we should include relationship building and solidarity as an element of how we do this. I think that maybe we do want to have a conversation about what cultivation might look like or what decriminalization might look like, but we should do it with the people who care the most about it. Yes. So I think that it's not to say like, oh, it's a bad idea to do this thing, to 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 cultivate or to decriminalize or to do this or that. I think, well, there's people who are really well positioned to understand the dynamics of the his especially the history of what's going on here. What, what would it mean for us to do it with them? What would it mean for us to be bringing everyone along? And so to me, like, this is harder with peyote because it's such a um because it takes so long to grow and because like people are like oh we got to get to we got to get to it but actually like it's true i don't think we need to decriminalize peyote right now if we get sp519 through there will be like seven six or seven different substances that are all available to people including mescaline from sources that aren't peyote so what if we took two extra years what if we took four extra yeah. years or five extra years or even longer to actually like be in alignment with the native american community in the united states to think about how to do that in the right way I think that's a that's worth the energy to I, agree. I think when we're thinking about policy it's not just about like what words make the best legal structure for what it is that we want policy making and this is where like the advocacy side of policy comes in it's you know we can just be like in our own silo and do what we think is right to the you know to the detriment of everyone else around us that's how a lot of big commercial operators within pharma and tons of other industries work but I think that if we're thinking about policy making in a grounded way, in a grassroots way, like it actually means being in alignment with as many of the stakeholders that we can. So just like, let's have this conversation. Let's have this conversation. And maybe it takes a few years to get to a point where we're like, yeah, this is the way that we do this in the safest way. And this would protect the medicine and this would do this. Like, I, I think we should take that time. I don't think we should rush when we're being asked not to rush. And if anything, it's an opportunity to take, take a closer look at like what's motivating us as individuals or as a community 
Um, I think it's easier for me to say like, yeah, we need to decriminalize mushrooms right now. We need to decriminalize all drugs right now because the criminalization of drugs has all these secondary effects. When it comes to legal regulation, who's like where the sourcing is coming from, what commercialization looks like. Yeah, let's take that slowly. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we're, we're entering a new territory and it's good to be like fleshing out all of this like weird and comfortable. It's like you were just saying, Seth, like, I don't know, like our job isn't to know. Our job is to say, like, here's what I understand right now. Let's talk about what the different sides are. What are our goals? What are the what are the harms we're trying to avoid? Like, no one wants peyote to go extinct. That's the thing. Like, everyone has different perspectives about how to make sure that peyote is safe. And to, and to unite on that front, yes. So we can also so we can also say yes, we don't want it to go extinct. Oh, thank God! Like, we're all fighting for that. And then you know, people have different perspectives about tactics. People have different theories of change. Yeah. Um, and that's where we really got to like engage. That's where I think the the discussion and dialogue really needs to happen. Yeah. I think this just opens up such a bigger you know conversation or just a, you know an adjacent conversation around like the plant spirit the connection that psychedelics give us they're not they're not like just molecules they're a gateway to change for so many people and not just it doesn't seem as just any old kind of change right it really is like a, a deepening of connection to spirit which you know that's a i'm going to try to use that in the broadest term mm -hmm. possible the broadest way possible because i think like even connection to yourself to your community to a relationship to the earth the thing you're a part of you know nature all that is spirit i think about psychedelics as a, a tool for making meaning out mm -hmm. of our experiences it helps us build meaning into the narrative of our lives and meaning can look like a lot of different things so i agree with you yeah. it's spirit but like it allows us to look at like our experiences and the context that we're in and, you know, create some sort of structure that allowed it, allows it to, maybe it doesn't make sense, but it means something. Sure. And that's, I think so much of like what allows us to transform because suddenly we're like, not just like floating in this ball of dust in the middle of space, but like, we're like protagonists in this story that we're at the center of. Yeah. Um, along with a bunch of other people who are the protagonists of their stories. And maybe we have to figure out how to, coexist a bit you know totally. yeah <laughs> and just hearing your story at the beginning it sounded like you were really trying to search for that meaning even before mm -hmm. you were looking to psychedelics you know that identity that you were searching for last year what was so impactful about when you were speaking in our community that so many people gave us feedback on was how meaningful it was that you were speaking about you know bringing your family into this work after so many years of you know slowly introducing them to this through education and information if you feel comfortable enough i'd love to kind of weave that conversation mm -hmm. back into this and um share have you share a little bit about what that journey has been like for you and your family yeah, yeah, I would love to. I mean, so just to recap for those that weren't, you know, there last year, I um, shared a bit about how, you know, after all of the angsty teen years that I was sh sharing about earlier, you know, I was using a lot of different drugs and seeking something and experimenting with whatever I could find. And it led to a lot of uh, tension in my relationship with my mother, who grew up in Colombia, was impacted by the war on drugs in Colombia, by the cocaine um, kind of uh, impacts on Cali and other places that she grew up. Um, so when she, you know, found out that I was like kind of experimenting with stuff, it really like affected our relationship. And I spent a lot of my life, uh, like, you know, especially near the end of her life in my late teens and early twenties, um, trying to figure out how to navigate with like this, this deep sense of like needing to explore and needing to build something, some sort of level of meaning and understanding of my own experience while also realizing that like, you know, my behavior was causing all this harm and, or causing all this hurt to, to my mother and to, to people around me and being like, but I'm doing it in a responsible way. How can I teach people that this is not what they're worried about, you know, and like kind of screaming into the void as like an 18 year old, like not exactly knowing what was going on. Um, and yeah, after, you know, after she passed uh, in 2013, um, a few years later, my family and I, um, it was actually my first experience with Yahe, uh, with, uh, you know, Yahe, which is what uh, the kind of brew DMT and MAOI ayahuasca brew is called in, in parts of Colombia. Um, and, you know, sitting in ceremony with three generations of my family and doing work specifically around like the death of my mother and doing work specifically around like how we process death and grief as a family and have since gathered, more, you know, more times and um, we'll be gathering again soon to kind of like deepen this intergenerational multi-level healing, if that's what you want to call it and what that means. And, you know, it's interesting, like I've, I've thought about this a lot over the last few years. The first time I shared the story in public was on a podcast in 2016. And 
it's funny because I'm, I, I still think it's a really powerful and, and inspiring story. And, um, sometimes I freak out, I get like what people call like a vulnerability hangover. I'm like, wow, I've shared a lot about myself. Have and I, it's like a lot of really personal stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in 2016, the audience of people that were interested in, um, like psychedelic substances and uh, this kind of work was much smaller in the sense that like hadn't really hit the mainstream yet. I think that really happened in 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. um, where we're kind of like in a new paradigm compared to where we've been for the last 20, 30 years. Um, and I, I really like one thing that I think is missing from that story is like the years of like effort and difficulty. And frankly, actually, I didn't even share this last year. You know, I was talking with my cousin who recently founded a nonprofit called Onca Foundation, O-N-C-A Foundation. You can see it at OncaFoundation.org. Um, you know, he recently started this organization and like at the time we were talking about it and I remember being like, yo, you know, I'm like 23. We're talking about like what it would mean to do ceremony with the family. I'm like, I, I can teach them. You know, I've been doing this for years. And he's like, how about you slow down for a second? Like, because the way that I approached this was like, like I said earlier, through recreation and celebration and partying and like this, like, woo, like the world is open. We can explore whatever. And the way my cousin had been approaching it was really much more through this like therapeutic, spiritual, much more structured system. He was like, you can't just like talk to your family about like your crazy rave experiences and expect them to be like, yeah, that's healing. Let's do it. Like you act, exactly. You actually have to go a little bit deeper and be like, well, what are the, um, like, what are the implications of what this is? What are the contexts in which this is safe? This kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about the containers. Like, we're not just saying like, deep cream means free for all, like do it everywhere. Who cares? Yeah. We're actually saying like, well, there's actually safer ways to do this. There's more responsible ways to do this. We're not going to arrest you if you don't do it that way. But we want those ways to be available to you because it'll be better for you and for society and for your family in the long run. So when I think about the story of my own family and like how, you know, we do this kind of level of healing on a personal level that then like I think must extend to our community, um, there does need to be some level of um, accountability to like what that actually means. And what I've realized is the one thing I learned is that, you know, people spend a lot of time um, repressing experiences for a reason. And if they don't have the right container to process that afterward, the psychedelic experience that cracks someone open might be worse for them. It might mm -hmm. actually cause a negative impact if they're not held in the right way. And I think this is what kind of gets lost when we talk about like people that are just trying to sell a product where they're like, oh, this will work. Because it's not that it works, it's that it opens up a p possibility for you to start working on yourself, exactly. you know? Yeah. And I think that when it comes to the, the stuff around family and people who are like, and, you know, I just want to acknowledge that, like, not everyone has, like, a good relationship with their blood family, with the people who raise them. And maybe doing that kind of healing does have to be done on their own. Like, I don't think it's, like, the imperative of every person to do psychedelics with their family members, you know? Like, that can be super traumatizing and it's definitely not for everyone. But I think thinking about, like, how how we think about the uh, construction of family today and you know people use the phrase chosen family a lot and like mm -hmm. what would it mean to be built those kind of relationships you know i know a lot of people who would say like the people they've been going to festivals with is their chosen family they've tripped a lot together they've like been through it they've held right. each other while they're crying they've gotten like water for each other in moments of extreme thirst <laughs> you know there's like that kind of like level of camaraderie and love and i think that kind of healing can actually be so effective for people's deep work um, and it kind of brings us out of this like very narrow, like single therapist, or in the case of MAPS, you know, two therapists, single person, individualized healing process and allows us to say, well, actually our healing ripples outward. And I think this is one thing that I think the kind of narrative, especially around ayahuasca and kind of more spiritual healing practices really helps because if you look a little bit more esoterically beyond just like biomedical science, you, you hear things like, oh, you can heal generations forward and back, or you can heal your community or healing ripples outward, even if you're doing it only to yourself. I think that this is a really interesting concept because like on one level, it can be kind of triggering and unhelpful to say, oh, we can heal the past. Like the past has been healed. Like, and you see people bypass a lot in that way where they're like, oh, we're, we're, this is like we're all one. And so because we're all one, like those other things don't matter. And I think that can actually be really harmful. So I think that there is a line of being like, well, we're not, when we say healing the past, we're not saying, well, everything that happened back then is okay. We're saying that we have an awareness of what those things are and accounting of visibility. I actually talked about this a bit in my first talk with SF Psychedelic Society two years ago at Odd Job in San Francisco, where it was like, how does psychedelics help us think about time? Mm -hmm. Anything that's ever happened is still happening until it's metabolized. And if something isn't um, 
incorporated into our narrative in a way that has meaning, then it becomes this disruptive force that then causes chaos for sometimes for people for the rest of people's lives. Yeah. So when it comes to this, like, you know, conversation about family healing, I'm like, it's not quite as simple as you can just take psychedelics and definitely don't dose, don't dose them without their consent. You know, it's not that simple and that's not the way to do it. You actually have like, and, and in the same way, like you can't force someone to take psychedelics. Like, you know, you can't say that someone's ready when they're not ready. Like they have to be ready. They have to decide. And ideally they're not deciding by themselves. They're deciding with their community. So it's not them being like, yes, I'm ready or no, I'll never be ready. It's like, oh, maybe there's a group of people that I can talk about and who know and who understand like what I'm dealing with, what I'm trying to bring forward. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it is. It's like, how do you bring the community into that healing process? I think it's so essential, you know, the reason we have to teach so much about the integration process, about the preparation process is because it's not embedded in the culture. Mm -hmm. And when we can start to embed those basic lessons just into the culture, that makes our job, you know, um, not it's less relevant in that capacity because now people can take our starting line, you know, and they can really move it into new conversations, new dimensions. And we can just hold a bigger container for that while we go on and be like, all right, well, that was the biggest issue that we were facing. What's the next thing, you know, where it's like, you can, you know, in your case, you, you know, you can do this, you can sit down with a family member and integrate, mm -hmm. you know, talk about your psychedelic experience and just the level of taboo that we're still experiencing. It's just, it's just not possible for so, so, so many people. And they wouldn't even want to risk. Uh, I think they come to us, you know, we have people from around the world coming to our zoom calls, you know, I mean, probably to the, you know, hundreds of people a month, you know, we have these different groups that, you know, they don't really have that community in their, in their own life. They don't really want to take the risk mm -hmm. of exposing themselves, mm -hmm. you know? And we've heard a lot of stories that of people that kind of face the consequences of taking that risk. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, I don't know. I, I wonder what, you know, I would like to look at like, what's our roadmap for like an embedded cultural uh, shift to be like, yes, yeah, like, you know, it's just somewhat normalized and we, we all those things, I guess, metabolism is a good way to look at it too. Like, are those lessons metabolized? Yeah. Are they just like part of the ethos of psychedelics? And I think the sooner that we can get to that place, the less we have to worry about um, these culture vultures and yeah. things like that, uh, trying to just manipulate. Well, part of the issue is that when people talk about psychedelics, they spend too much time talking about the psychedelics. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, they spend they spend a lot of, and I get it. I get it. They're powerful experiences. Like I understand why people are so fixated on the actual molecules or the medicine or the substances themselves. Like I get it. Yeah. Um, but you know, having had my own experiences now for fifteen years, at least fifteen years this year since my first psychedelic experience and um i've had many you know and since since then and um a lot of the processing and work and growth that i've done which is not over you know like it's a light literally an actually lifetime process of like growing and unpacking and repacking and refining and whatever it is that we're trying to do that makes life meaningful um i i have become less and less uh, reliant on mere, like just like the container of the experience and recognize that like, well, what I, it's really about like, how can I prepare myself for whatever it is that's going to emerge? How mm. can I, um, make sure that whatever it is that's comes up, that's properly, uh, that's probably integrated into my life. You know, a few years ago, I actually took a full year off of taking any substances like that because I was like, you know, I have a lot to integrate right now. Like I'm kind of like at my eyeballs in stuff and material that's come up. Like maybe I should spend some time just like living and just figuring like, how do I make micro changes to my life, to my routine, to like what I eat, what I drink, how I, you know, my sleep hygiene, you know, basic stuff yeah. like that, that I think is actually quite essential to our well being. Um, and if psychedelics do allow us to get kind of closer to a sense of well being, then it's not happening just because you're having big experiences. It's happening because you're uh, actually like figuring out what the important things are that are coming up in your experiences and then applying them to your life, which then, forces you to make decisions about your life. Um, you know, I, you know, a lot of, you hear this a lot from like, from integrative doctors and people who do kind of integrative medicine where people want to be healed or cured, but they don't want to change their lifestyle. And like a lot of people don't want to hear this because like we kind of live in a world where people want to just be like, well, I should be able to do whatever I want and like should be fine, you know? And sure. Like, yes, like on a, like fundamental level of your rights. Like I agree with that. I think as long as it's not hurting other people, and like, you can't actually expect things to change for yourself personally, if you're not willing to make those changes. And like, this isn't like, I'm not trying to be like victim blaming or anything along, the line, along those lines, but people 
do have some agency. And I think one of the beauty, beautiful things about psychedelics is that they actually show people about the agency that they have in whatever environment that they're in. It's the, that they're in. It's certainly true that people are extremely subject to larger social and political forces. That's so much of what my early life kind of showed me that I was like, oh, regardless of like who I am, where my parents come from, what I'm doing, like I actually do have a certain level of personal responsibility that I do have to bring forward. So I'm not on the side of like, personal responsibility isn't real. Everything has to be like society taken care of or that personal society, personal responsibility is the only thing. I don't, I don't think that we can fully rely only on individual responsibility, like the very kind of like American individualist perspective. Yeah. I do think that there is uh, an element of both, like society should be taking care of people better than it is right now. And people have more agency than they're often told, but I don't put that blame on the individual. I think that we're socialized and conditioned to believe that we don't yes. have that, that agency and learning that we we can actually choose for ourselves, do our own research, all of that um, is a huge part of, um, again, making meaning toward life. Now, the flip side to that is when people think that think that they're free willed, think that they're you know separate from any influence in the world, and then they end up like denying COVID or whatever. But that's like a whole other like kind of rabbit hole because I think like there's a balance between being like a free thinker and thinking on your own, and also being like, well, what is true enough for me to actually like base certain decisions of my life on. And that's where things start to get kind of complicated. And like, how do you want to ripple out in the people around you? You know, how do you want to impact those people? Because mm -hmm. even if I don't believe, you know, I'm not saying this, but even for example, if I don't believe in COVID, mm -hmm. it's like, is that, do I want to show up at your house without a mask and be like, you idiot, like, mm -hmm. why do you still believe? You know what I mean? It's totally. like, all right, well, just be respectful. You know? totally. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, I want to ask you, like, do you ever think about this much, much, much bigger set and setting of like, the world is on fire. It is experiencing a fever and actively trying to kill humanity. Like, you know, <laughs> that's I a dramatic actually, way to say that. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, because that's where I get my sense of personal responsibility is trying to sit with that. And like, you know, it's our culture that is destroying this planet that we live on. And I'm not saying that psychedelics need to heal that, but I, I, I'm, I'm kind of here in part because I hope that they might mm -hmm. have something to do with that. They yeah, have for me. Yeah. And that's what's important. And I think that community lessons around connection are essential. Big question. Yeah. No, I, I think I'll first say that I don't think it's true that like psychedelics inherently make people more like politically progressive or liberal. And I know that's not exactly what you were saying, but a lot of sure. people pair these things where they're like, yeah. oh, it makes you more like climate conscious and it makes you more liberal. I'm like, eh. <laughs> I think actually the experience of psychedelics are extremely influenced by like the micro set and setting in context, which is why you can do why people who have like really terrible politics can do ceremony and kind of having the same politics, but maybe like also being more empathetic toward people yeah. you know, at the same time. Or um, more grandiose. Or, or more grandiose. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly more like in kind of like a megaloma megalomaniacal like kind of ego trip. That definitely happens too. And it's something we need to talk about as part of harm reduction, you know, like susceptibility to these kind of like concepts and like what it means to stay grounded. This is part of integration, like staying grounded uh even in the face of like whatever else is coming up but to answer your question i do think that one thing that psychedelics can do is bring more um support attention visibility and like capacity for people to be aware of our impact on our host our beautiful mother earth Pacha Mama. and i do think that like although i wouldn't always say that like psychedelics are going to like change politics quite so much i do think that your point about their role in transitioning us away from an, a primarily like extractive kind of place like behaviorally and by that I'm, I'm really talking about like western industrialized society in particular um i do think that there is a role there and i think that but that is i wouldn't say it's inevitable i think that that actually has a lot to do with how the culture of psychedelics is brought forward like mm -hmm. if psychedelics are brought forward as just another pharmaceutical intervention maybe maybe not if it's brought forward in a way that's built around community, earth consciousness, like active, like activism in the sense of like working to make the community a better place. Um, I, I, I do feel like that there's a lot of potential that they, that they can have there. So I do feel like that there's something that psychedelics do around changing kind of fundamental values that people might have. Um, and I'm just, I'm very careful about this conversation because it's so easy to then be like, well, they're just like, you know, um, inherently good. There's like an inherently yeah. good aspect of it. And well, I, think I, mean, that's, I tried to ask it in a way. It's like, you know, just how do you see the interaction between those two things? Because, you know, I think, you know, psychedelics help with awareness, you know, in, in, in certain cases. You know, yeah, they can definitely help with certain kinds of self-awareness. 
Um, and this is what I mean about meaning making. And this is why, like, I'm actually pretty resistant. I, I wouldn't, I would have thought of, thought about this differently five years ago. But this is why I kind of frame psychedelics as like a tool for making meaning, because making meaning is very subjective. It's a purely subjective experience about like what a person has with relation to like their own arc of their experience, and that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Um, so I do, I do think that there is an interaction between the two, and to the extent that psychedelics are coming out of a culture that is you know, dedicated to and focused on um, bettering ourselves, bettering community, better, bettering the world around us. Yes, those things like totally link together. Um, and, you know, I remember when, um, you know, all of the energy about like the activities around January 6th and the insurrection and all that stuff came up. There's a lot of conversation about this like horned guy, um, the Q shaman and people were like, well, see, see, psychedelics don't make you good. Like they actually yeah. can make you kind of like crazy, kind of crazy. And sure, like maybe there's a little of that that's true. Um, and like, and that's the thing. It's like, it, the answer is yes and. Like they do a lot of different things for different people. Yeah. And like, that's why we have to pay so much attention to the context in which they're occurring. Like, that's why. Because I'm not quite on the, you know, I don't quite believe that they're like totally, you know, there's that term, um, non-specific amplifiers of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a little bit more than that. I personally yeah. am a little bit esoteric. I believe that the molecules mm -hmm. And the plants have their own consciousness of some kind. Yeah. They have their own vibration that's actually interacting with our with our experience. I actually think that there's some level of that. Like I don't think it's all happening in our head. That's just my own personal belief system. Um, but I do think that like they are still filtered through our conscious experience. Even if during the experience we don't always see that. Sometimes you're like, there is no ego. There is only the thing. Um, but afterward, you're going to come back to your ego and yourself, oh, yeah. and you're going to filter your experiences through your consciousness, even if you've been totally cracked open. Yeah. Um, so there's a way where like the way that you that your own consciousness is prepared for primed for that kind of transformation, it, it actually does matter. It does actually have an impact. Yeah. I wanted to bring it back to your family. And, you know, we didn't really fully finish that. But yeah. I think the cons the the topic of meaning making in, mm -hmm. in relationship to that story is like maybe a, a cool vein to um, kind of surf there because how did that impact you know you, you know having that experience together with your family was there a really rich bonding was there a new kind of foundation for you guys to move on from well what's funny is that i think my family has bonded more during covid than ever before because <laughs> suddenly we're just on video chats with each other <laughs> like That's so sweet. much more often you know yeah. um, my family spread around all over um california and central america and south america so it's hard to like again this is actually a really good kind of segue from what you were just saying because like like sure like doing the medicine together was a part of it but spending like eight days with a family cooking together, like going on hikes, like going on adventures, like that is its own thing. You know, there's that amazing, I think it's a Ram Dass quote, you know, you think you're enlightened until you spend a week with your family. And it's like, yeah, like <laughs> good luck with withholding all your cool downloads, like hanging out with your brothers or your cousins or your aunts or uncles or dad for a week. But you're like shushing your mom. Totally, totally, <laughs> totally, totally. I'm like, I spend the first, it's so funny. I spend like so many years like praying, you know, my mom's, she's transitioned, she's in the spirit realm. I'm like, just show me a sign and like you know the second she shows it i'm like okay mom <laughs> i get it i get it you know like um so yeah like of course all those things are also part of our truth right and part of our, our experience and so i, I don't want to like you know project anything onto my family around like what the experience did for them sure. or for us but i do feel for me personally i think like it helped me understand a little bit more about what it meant to be like losing my mother it helped me understand a little bit more of like what it meant um, and what uh, gifts reality, you know, offers, uh, even in the midst of this of this truth. And, um, you know, this is totally not the same, but I do feel that I had quite a bit of experience with grief, certainly not grief for losing a mother. That's like a whole, its own level of, of, of work. But, um, you know, prior to that point happening, like I had, I have had many friends die by suicide and from overdose and have like really terrible experiences. Mm -hmm um with drugs and without them um with their own mental health struggles with their own families with their own things so i think that like in, to some extent i had like a real i had a real uh like training i guess in grief um and have spent a lot of time thinking about grief and transition and obviously i don't have like the answer or know exactly like what uh it means and what meaning we must create out of loss um, but I do feel like, you know, after my mother passed and then shortly years after my grandfather passed away, 
Um, and that's after losing my, my father's parents who had passed away a couple of years before that uh, in Pakistan. Um, to me, so much of like the, the um, solace that comes from like having like a really powerful like ego annihilating psychedelic experience is just the awareness that we don't know what's going on or what happens before or after. Um, and I am like here for all of the interpretations, but my personal perspective is like, if we don't know, then like, I am okay with opting for the perspective that like, there's something beautiful happening. Um, to me, I kind of think of it as like the placebo effect, like of, of like lack consciousness where I'm like, I don't really like need to know what happens before or after. Like, of course I have this, like, and especially, you know, I, I turned 30 last year and I'm like in this phase of like deep existential, you know, reanalysis of my whole life and purpose and path. And I'm like, what does it all mean? Like, where am I going? And um, I think that like, I, to me, like so much of what the psychedelic experiences, both personally and with my family have offered has been like a comfort in not knowing yeah. and like allowing myself to just be with that not knowing and create whatever meaning is works for me. Like, and you know, there was that study that came out recently showing that the microdosing, um, the microdosing has, a, or maybe explained by the placebo effect. And I actually love that study. Like I, I've heard yeah. lots of anecdotal experience that it actually works. Like I've had my own experiences that they've worked. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that the fact that something has a placebo effect means it's not real. Yeah, this is so, uh, <laughs> I'm all about the placebo well. effect. Me too. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'm a huge fan because it's like, what you're basically telling me is it's mind over matter. It, you know, you're saying that, hey, this, like what you think that this will do for you is is what's doing it, you know? Yeah. And then if you look at how that translates to psychedelics, you talk about, oh, it's really important to set an intention. Yeah. It's really important to prepare yourself because it's so related to all the factors that are not the molecule itself, right. which that it's in this context that I really do use the term non-specific amplifier. Yes. yes what are you yes. amplifying? Exactly. Amplify exactly. The, the placebo, right? Yeah. Amplify the hope, the dream, amplify what you want come out of it. And it almost seems like we just don't know how to classify these substances. Right. They're actually really good at being a placebo. Right. Like the best placebo right. you can ask for. Right. Sasha Shulgin has this amazing, there's a quote, and I think it's in Tikal, that's it's i'm gonna butcher it if i try to quote it but it's something to the effect of you know um there's no way that the states of being that these substances experience can allow for can be contained within like this white crystalline powder mm -hmm. you know they're keys to our consciousness and i think mm -hmm. i love that that's because true. it's it's a really good reminder that like there is a relationship occurring between the substance that we're ingesting and our mind that's receiving it. Yeah. And to say it's just one or just the other, I think both of those perspectives are missing something. Yeah. I agree. I love the concept of psychedelics already showing us what's inside of us. Yeah. yeah. Just a tool to help us unlock our own consciousness. Yeah, totally, totally. Sorry, my nose is so itchy today. I don't know why. That's not going to look good on camera. Dude. I know, I know. I'm like, I'm like, what am I allergic to? I'm allergic to really good questions. <laughs> yeah. So let's bring it back to um, just to start to come to like wind down a little bit. Let's come back to SB519. Mm -hmm. What are the next steps for that? Mm -hmm. How can people get involved? What are some of the call to actions? Yeah. So there's going to be a hearing in early April. Um, it's going to be in the public safety committee in early April. There's going to be a second hearing in that has not been scheduled yet in the health committee. Um, both of these, just for people who may aren't familiar, basically what happens is the bill is introduced and then it actually is introduced into, uh, and referred to certain committees and committees of people within the Senate then discuss the bill, you know, make amendments, make changes, make suggestions, and it has to go through those committees before it can come to a floor vote. So we actually have, um, there's actually going to be a process that's needed that, that, that we're going through that, that, um, that the bill is going through that involves like multiple layers of discussion. Um, for those people that are looking to support, I think especially people who aren't in the Bay Area, all this is true for people in the Bay Area too, like, you know, figuring out who your representative is. This is like, you know, I'm thinking especially for people that are like in Fresno or, you know, Southern California, Inland Empire, like these different areas really find out how you're representative and like talking to them about this bill. Like there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people don't understand psychedelics. And even though, you know, maybe those of us in this community are in a teeny bit of a bubble, you know, in the sense that we're like, oh, well, we, we have a sense of what's going on. You know, you guys are doing great educational work. Like, you know, we know that there's a way you can find this info. Um, a lot of people 
don't have that information, don't have that knowledge and consciousness. But I mean, using myself as a reference point, like I don't, I don't get a lot of this stuff. You know what I mean? Totally. I'm not constantly on. I don't have like a, a news feed of just psychedelic stuff popping up all the time. You know, I hear stuff through the grapevine here and there. So I, I think it's actually hard, hard to get this info. Again. It is. And, and policy is like intentionally complex, right? It's like, it's, yeah. it's actually quite difficult to follow. Um, and it can be really like, uh, kind of archaic in certain ways. And, um, I mean, this is kind of a new experience in the sense that, I believe, I mean, it's, this isn't, this is definitely the first goal of its kind in the sense that this is the first time that we're having a conversation about decriminalizing psychedelics at a state level through a state legislature. Um, and I think that like, you know, there was a lot of public conversation around um, measure 110 in Oregon around like all drug decrim. And I think as these other states have started to come forward, there's going to be more visible conversation about it. But a lot of people within the community, within the psychedelic community, or the, a lot of people who use psychedelics, um, maybe aren't already plugged into like what policy making looks like so for many people this is also the process of their political socialization yeah. they're learning how the system works for the first time because suddenly there's an issue that they care about that they are needing to pay attention to um and you know like there's a kind of culture of like keyboard warriors that have kind of emerged in this and it's 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 and i don't mean that to be the right divide uh kind of um, negative in the sense that like I do think that there's like a place where personal advocacy through the internet or so on like takes us to a certain extent but powerful, yeah. it, it is it is super powerful and it takes us to a certain point and like now what we're doing is we're trying to bring these concepts forward into like some level of mainstream or visibility or structure and this is kind of where the rubber hits the road as they say where it's like well we're actually trying to change law which means that we can that this will be enforced yeah um, and until we live in a system where enforcement of law is not done with coercion and violence. Um, that's what we're saying. We're saying that these are the things that we think that should be, you know, uh, um, justified through like this, like kind of the course of arm of the state. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big thing. And that's why I think there's a lot of like, uh, there can be a lot of like hubris in policy making where like we know better. And that's why going back to what we were talking about earlier, this is why I think that grassroots element had happened. So for people around the state of California, I think like, you know, speaking to the representatives, I think like, as always, I feel, I feel like I've said this at like all of the talks I've done with you guys, but like talk to your family members and if not family members then like, you know, your mentors, people who are around you, like Carl Hart came out with his book, drug use for grownups. And a lot of the, what he talks about is like coming out of like the drug using closet and, I don't know, you know, not everyone loves that metaphor. And there's a lot of like com complexities to that. Not everyone is in a position where they can safely do that. People have licenses at risk. People have yeah. all kinds of things that they're worried about. Um, and I think like the conversation is getting a little bit no more normalized. And it's important that like the people who are visible are not just like psychonauts who are going super hard or people who are like chasing their peak experiences. I think that there's a way that we need to, so a lot of people don't want to do this because they, they want to think that psychedelics are cool, but we got to make them ordinary. We got to make them just part of human experience, which is what they are and have been for such a long time. Not ordinary as in, oh, they're unimportant, but ordinary as in they are also part of like this giant web of experiences that we're having. So I think part of it is like cultural, like kind of community building and knowledge and all of those pieces. And I think part of it is uh, more practical, which is like, you know, once we go through, once we go through these processes of like talking through committee, um, or getting this bill going through committee, um, I think that there is actually going to be, there's going to need to be like a really robust conversation at the state level with people all over the state around like, well, what are the implications of this bill and how can we make it better? And I think like, it's good that people are reading it carefully and critiquing it. I think it's yeah. good that this bill is getting critiqued. I think it's good that we're not like assuming that the way that something moves forward because we're like pro psychedelics, like is doing is moving in the right way like that's why i think it's important that we like push back have these nuanced conversations kind of go from there there's not a rush here you know trying to be the first yeah i mean th that's actually it's a cool funny that you bring that up because i think a lot about the um the balance between like urgency of need and quality of care and mm -hmm. that's really what it is it's like people feel very urgent around this and i yeah. get why there's so much suffering but like going back to the accountability conversation we were having earlier um Urgency should not happen at the expense of quality, safety, and accountability. Which it almost exclusively does. You know, Often you know. does. Yeah. yeah. I would say ur urgency is a value that I'm very skeptical of nowadays. Like, yeah, everything is actually urgent. But because everything is so urgent, um, I think it's actually more important that we be careful. It's actually, it's kind of this like go slow to go fast thing. Like, yeah. we got groundwork to set. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. We're, we're, we're a baby boom. Yeah. So. It is happening and it's been happening and yeah. will continue to be happening. Yeah. So what is the timeline on this and are these hearings going to be taking place online? Yeah. The hear- so I, I wish I could give more specific information today. I think that maybe once this is released, we could put out, put out a post with more specific details. Mm-hmm. Um, the first, the public safety hearing is going to be April 6th. The uh, health uh, committee hearing has not been scheduled as of now. By the time this gets released, it may be have, may have been scheduled. Um, I think it should be scheduled by the beginning of April. Um, and I'm guessing after, they're online. Yeah, and they will be yeah. online. It's really hard to tell what the timeline is going to be, though. When this bill was first introduced, Senator Reed's office was under the impression a lot of us thought that this was going to be like a two year long process. Like it's going to go to the committee. It's going to get referred back. There's going to be amendments. It's going to be a long thing. Mm-hmm. It still could take literally years for this to pass. Like it could like also take months. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, I wouldn't take it for granted that it would pass. And I would say that like, even if like we see good support in a lot of different directions, um, there does need to be a certain level of uh, like um, tracking of what's occurring um, because, you know, these systems are like kind of intentionally a bit, like I said, esoteric and difficult to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I know our, well, there's been a lot of excitement in the community about this, and I think it's going to be setting, um, you know, even if it doesn't pass, it's at least getting that conversation started. And for, there's so many other states and countries that are looking towards California. Exactly. And that's the other thing. California has like 40 million people or something like that. It's a lot of people, um, which means that what happens in California will probably have a huge impact on what happens um, everywhere else. Um, whether we like it or not. <laughs> so it is important, I think, that we get it. I wouldn't say get it right because I don't want to put too much pressure on it. Of course, we want to get it right. But we also know that we're learning as we go um, and that this is an iterative process, which is hard for me because I'm kind of a perfectionist. I'm more likely to like hold something back for way too long than to put it out and like work on it uh, and build on it. Um, but I do think that for for this, like, you know, we know that people shouldn't be criminalized for their use and possession of certain substances or of any substances, period. Uh, so that's a good place to start. And then to the other questions around commercialization and legal regulation and access and sourcing, we should talk about that stuff. We do. We should take our time talking about that stuff. Yeah, I hope it's fast enough that it stays relevant and that it's not like undercut by somebody that is like just expediency is key and like, you know, kind of making like quick, uh, I guess just some quick judgment calls about what we all need right now. I was talking to my friend in the Czech Republic a couple of days ago and she was like, yeah, for a long time, she was like, I was the one who was pushing things. We got to move, we got to move, we got to move. And then she had a few powerful personal experiences, not even psychedelic ones, just like personal experiences and realized that the moving fast thing actually prevents us from doing things in the right way sometimes. Yes. And um, like, this is why, like, you know, people often assume that MAPS is like just universally pro psychedelics and whatever. And we're always very careful to say, like, Yes, we believe psychedelics have tremendous value and can do a lot of, have tremendous benefits for individuals, for society, potentially for the world, no doubt. But that doesn't happen like on accident or randomly. It happens because there's like an intention that's brought to this work. And there are a lot of risks and concerns that we need to talk about. And it's by talking about those risks and concerns that we build trust, that we build legitimacy, that we show that we're like, we know what we're talking about, that we know that we're actually trying to help people be safer. We're trying to help people be more responsible. And I think that's actually quite a big part of doing responsible policymaking and intentional policymaking is like thinking about the impacts beyond just like, you know, for us, for me as a person, like I got to think about well, how this affect other people that are in other positions that have other kinds of resources and access to different things. Yeah. There's so many different perspectives on this right now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really great to get yeah. figures. I mean, you have such a, I think top, I don't want to say top down, but you know, broad view of yeah. the, uh, you know, of the whole psychedelic ecosystem. So yeah. Uh, Eagle eye view. I really feel like you're just like this, almost this protective guiding <laughs> Eagle. Sometimes I feel kind of like spacey because, you know, we're having these conversations and I'm like, can you even understand what I'm saying? Like, am I like, cause it's so vague, you know, it's so broad and so like big and like, so complicated. I was just, I, I was just getting kind of warm. So I just yeah, figured that here, right? I, I, I mean, even though I'm wearing a sweatshirt as we're, as we're kind of like wrapping up. I, I love your shirt, that. man. Well, oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. I'm wearing my giant tie dye psychedelic shirt. Wow. How, how did that happen? I expect <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> I expect that back later. But totally. Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, so oh, I know today we've talked a lot about 
what's going on within policy and advocacy. And um, I'd love to just give a little bit of space for your work at MAPS and, you know, for those that aren't familiar with your work and what are you working on right now and where do you see the future of MAPS going? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so MAPS is in a really interesting place right now. Um, you know, we went from being kind of this like, uh, underdog, scrappy nonprofit for, you know, literally two decades, almost three decades to being at the forefront of an emerging, like massive, apparently very well-funded biotech industry, um, which <laughs> is a little bit, very well funded, yeah. Yeah, very, which is pretty concerning at times, um, and can be kind of, um, intense, you know, to really think about like the implications of like what, um, what we're doing and what's happening in the world and like the, uh, implications of what's being brought forward. Um, I sometimes I wonder, is, is it possible to bring forward huge changes in society in ways that are purely positive, that are don't have any sort of like secondary effect? I really don't know the answer. I think that like everything comes with a certain level of pros and cons and we do have to have a level of take a level of responsibility with that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, from my perspective, I've spent a lot of time in the last year, you know, working with maps to, um, uh, build out its internal infrastructure, like building out its governance infrastructure, mm -hmm. like preparing it for like engaging with like the world in a more uh, structured, solid, stable way. Um, you know, MAPS is full of visionaries um, and, you know, we brought on a lot more really hard workers and people who have a really uh, like solid kind of grounded approach mm -hmm. toward like not just like the research, uh, but certainly the research, the therapy, to the ethics, to the like how we comply with these large regulatory systems. Like these are all things that I think um, these are all things that I think have uh, like have that ripple effect that we were talking about. And, you know, I'm, I'm I mean, I kind of knew this, but it's becoming really clear, like how big of a role that maps has played and is playing and what our responsibility is to make sure that things come forward in a good way. So I feel like, you know, looking forward, I would really like to see like maps for sure, but also the field as a whole, like think a lot more about like what economic models we want to be looking at for regulation. Um, specifically, like what would it look like to create commercial access through um, like cooperative models through cooperative economics, reparative economics, like, how can we build reparations and reciprocity into the system of access? Like, that is a big question. Like, how do we think about, um, how do we think about like what, how, how the industry or how the field has emerged from the underground and like, how do we give back? And, you know, there's a big conversation emerging around like reciprocity and what that means and how companies can do it and so on. And I think that, you know, that's kind of, maybe a bigger conversation, but like it does go to like what responsibility I think maps and other entities like us have in the field. And like knowing that there's all these new actors, like wanting to got kind of play that kind of guiding role and be like how, and you know, knowing that we're also emerging in our own knowledge and being like, how do we do this in a way that's responsible, not just to ourselves, but also to society more broadly. You know, I, I like to use this like anecdote that like, there's a lot of people who, I think I might've even said this last year. There's a lot of people who like, would never go to an underground facilitator. They would only ever go to a doctor. There's a lot of people who would never ever go to a doctor and they'd only ever go to an underground facilitator. So I think we think a lot about that. You know, some people, um, some people might even say that like we work against our economic interests because we fight for decrim. Like we're saying like actually maps and the FDA is not the only way you should be able to get access to MDMA. Yeah. We fight for decrim and legal regulation. Um, which sure, some people might say like, oh, that like affects our bottom line. Like that might be Great. one way to push it. But it's also like what we think is more important for society. Or like the triple bottom line. <laughs> quadruple, like quintuple bottom line. Yeah. We're actually looking beyond just like people, profits and planet. It's also like, well, what are the implications of the systems that we're building? What yeah. will this mean two generations, three generations or more down the line? Um, so when we're thinking about like these super powerful substances, like we can't take these questions lightly. And I think that's what MAPS has been at. We're at this like, big existential crossroads. Yeah. Like, what does it mean to be in this role and to bring things forward? Like, how can we do that responsibly? Can I, can I ask you a question about that crossroads? Like, of course. 
of course, like as an organization grows, as a thing, like as power grows, and as power grows, uh, the light that it can produce grows. But so can like the accidental shadows that you know are are caught up in that. And I think we all experience that in our personal lives. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there like a consideration around how big maps? wants to be because mm. oversight and like you know the potential risks of that um just kind of i don't know it kind of get, it gets so big and amorphous at a certain point it's like are how do you even know if you're staying true to the goals you know it can get yeah to totally good question you don't want to get yeah I, I don't know if i know how big we want to get um sure. <laughs> partially because but but it's a good question because i think that in some ways it's quite emergent it's like in some ways responsive to what's occurring like sure it's hard to imagine like what maps would be like now if there weren't these other large for-profit actors and like do we have to adjust to like compete with them do we have to just keep doing our thing and stay where we're at like you know, there's been a big, we don't have to go into it too much today, but there's, there's been this deep, deep conversation lately happening around like for-profit mm -hmm. entities and like yeah. patents specifically and IP and all of that. And oh, like, they're next round. Cool. Yeah. Perfect. And like, you know, there, there's, there's valid questions there. And I think like maps has pretty actively pursued what, what we're calling kind of like an anti-patent strategy, which is really just a way to make sure that there's um, like some level of transparency with the way that we're trying to bring this medicine forward and like we're actually really proud that we'll be developing something into a generic that then you know after data exclusivity which is the process of fda granting us exclusive rights to our data for a certain period of time it's similar to a patent but works shorter and isn't isn't exclusive or and 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 runs out after about five years like we're thinking like it's actually a good thing that MAPS isn't the only place that people will be, will be able to get MDMA. Like Rick Doblin, you know, our founder, thinks of MAPS as like a public utility, which I think is actually a really interesting way to think of it as opposed to just like a nonprofit. It's like, how can we be in support of like all of this happening, all of this going forward in a way that's also responsible, that's, uh, uh, you know, allowing people to get access to education, the harm reduction, that's taking this full spectrum truth to it. That's not just like, oh, we're going to glamorize psychedelics, say everyone should do it and try to shove the concept down your throat. It's actually like, no, no, how do, do we do this responsibly, knowing that these things already exist, that it's already happening in the underground? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How long have we been here? I saw you checking the time. We've been here for exactly two hours. It's exactly two hours from the time that we started, which is like a solid, solid it, was, it was a bit meandering in like the best way. Like we covered a good amount of stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, I mean, I'm down to kind of like start wrapping up, but I'm curious, like, if there's any other like big questions that have come up for you all or that like, you know, your community is asking you that like, I can give any more information about. I mean, definitely there's a lot of conversation around um, patents, patenting mm -hmm. processes, all the money that's pouring into mm -hmm. the space and just curious, like how you're viewing that process unfold and how you see that. Um, like what are the internal conversations that are happening yeah. that people aren't hearing about? Yeah. I mean, so maybe the first thing I'll say is that like there's a little bit of background that's really helpful for people to understand when we're talking about like patents and specifically like the U.S. healthcare industry. Um, there's a lot of conversations we have that are based in like the scarcity that comes out of working in a system where the only way to get coverage for care is through insurance. So a lot of these larger companies are saying, oh, it's necessary to get patents so you can get the investments, so you can scale, so you can do the thing. Like, and I understand why they why they believe that because that is true when it comes to like the just the realities of healthcare in the United States right now. Um, and I think people are rightfully freaking out when they're attempting to like patent or take credit for things that aren't theirs or that are like beyond like what they have actually discovered or done the work to to incorporate. And even if they have, like, not everyone pe not everyone believes that like patents as far as like a way to um, kind of protect information or even like the right mechanism to do it. You know, my Myself and some colleagues, uh, Inti Garcia from Mexico, as well as um, Konstantin Gerber and Eduardo Schenberg and Natalie Ginsberg and Angelica Ruiz, like we just published this article, um, or we just had this article published that's about ethical concerns related to psilocybin intellectual property. And it's funny, there was a there was an article in Brazil that was originally in Portuguese that about it that said like researchers demand reparations to the Massatec for psilocybin intellectual or for intellectual property. Mm -hmm. I think that there are probably some people in the list of authors that probably believe that. Um, and I think that's a totally fair thought to believe. And I think it's a little more complicated than that. I think like the U.S. kind of patent system actually doesn't do a good job of like holding 
uh, community information. And I think like, you know, people have talked about like patent pools and trusts and different ways to think about how to protect that information. But ultimately, I think that like we're, we can't look to like the current legal infrastructure to save us. It's actually going to have to be a combination of like what structures exist that are real and also like what um, like what permit like what people actually believe that they can do in the positions that they're in. You know, people ask a lot, like, well, how do we be in reciprocity? And, you know, I've heard, I've obviously done my best to listen to people who have educated me about this conversation or about reciprocity, indigenous folks and others. Um, and what I usually hear is like, well, it, like, it depends. Like, what resources do you have? What's your positionality? Like, who do you know? What relationships do you have? It's kind of like what you were saying, Seth, around like, well, you shouldn't just like trust the first person who's like, I can answer this question for you. I can do this. I can get you the drugs that you want, whatever. You actually need to like be building relationships. And if the main outcome of the, you know, the movement to mainstream and bring forward psychedelics in the field is to build better relationships, including with people who may be getting exploited, that whose information might be drawing from to get access to things. I think that that could be a good outcome where there's actually like an impetus to be having these conversations. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if the conversations alone will change the world, you know, like I'm not exactly that naive. I do think that there's, you know, there's a certain level of like really important accountability that's also necessary that like is easily bypassed when you have a lot of money and good PR. Um, and I, you know, I worry that like when it comes to like reciprocity, we'll see companies be like, oh, well, we'll give 3.5% <laughs> of our profits in 12 years to this one nonprofit. <laughs> it's like, eh, I don't know if that counts as reciprocity. By the way, we have a huge stake in that nonprofit. <laughs> exactly, no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And like, and they're also, and they're also helping us kind of like tie-dye wash our image, whatever. So I, I agree. Ooh, I like, heard that one, like green wash, tie -dye. Yeah, I mean, it, tie -dye wash is like a little bit too many syllables. It's like, yeah. it's a little bit too... Um, <laughs> Hard right. to say, but like if you, if you think of something like that, that's kind of. All right, I'll try to improve. I've heard the term light washing. Like people are like, "Oh, I'm a light worker." Like light washing. Like, like interesting. Like, everything yeah. is everything is one. Because <laughs> of the <laughs> off white wash. Yeah, totally. Wow. Um, and like, yeah, I also believe that everything is one, but I don't let that, that get in the way of like the realities of my social <laughs> political awareness because that's how I think we fight toward justice is by holding both of these things at the same time. I also share the viewpoint of the soap I use. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <sighs> yeah, I think that what I've come up a lot against a lot is I've been really trying to be vocal about like just what I see as like the systems of capitalism and how like a lot of people, I don't know, you know, I'm seeing a lot of this like professionals in the space that are just like kind of embracing the shift towards the capitalists kind of showing up and, and taking their piece and I, I'm cool with it on the level, like, I'll accept it because I have to, you know, because it's just is happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to live in resistance. But at the same time, like, I don't want to get in line to, like, kiss their boots or, you know, polish their shoes. Because I, I really think that no matter what they say they're here for, as soon as a company is publicly traded, you know, it's all marketing now. Mm -hmm. You know, everything they're saying is really just to get you on their side for their branding image. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really determines what they do next is how profitable it is. And that's legally mandated by the mm -hmm. system that we live in mm -hmm. to, you know, for their shareholders, which is not the community. You know, it's these very specific people that invested. Right. Um, and I'm like a nonprofit structure, you know, like we're really here for the community. B Corp, I guess it's it's like a promise, you know, it's a little better. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's obviously these, this variety of structures and, yeah, it comes back to accountability. But what's important to remember, I just think, is that on a corporate level, like with publicly traded company, especially that it's the investors that the accountability is to, and that that's a legal mandate and that a company could get sued for not doing something that could have made them mm -hmm. more money, obviously. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like the, there's so many things pushing away from morality. There's so many things pushing away from the quote unquote right thing, pushing away from the lessons that we might gather from our such like downloads mm -hmm. and pushing just towards the same system that got us here in the first place. And I just don't know if a lot of people that are kind of in defense of or whatever with the, the larger corporate structure get how pervasive those systems are. And when you bring lobbying into the mix and changing the ideal, the ideals of, uh, you know, our lawmakers when, you know, on the ground, grassroots worked so hard for decades, you know, with enough 
PR and money and all totally. that. It's just a snap of the fingers to be like, let's run the campaign, let's change their minds. You know, yeah, ads on it, Facebook. I, anyway, I, yeah. I was just reading about how a number of tobacco companies recently came together to create a lobbying group specifically around marijuana law, marijuana mm-hmm. policy, and I do think that there's every reason for. Um, large, well-funded companies that are trying to enter the space to push policy in the direction that they want. Um, and I think that there it's really imperative for the community of people who care about these substances, like, you know, outside of that system to bring attention to that. Like, I think, you know, Christian Angermeyer in a blog post that he recently published in response to Tim Ferriss's questions about p- patents was like, well, you know, my companies aren't ever going to knock on your door and prevent you from growing your mushrooms. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not worried about the companies. I'm worried about the lobbyists that the companies hire to influence the policymakers who are then biased against home grow. Like this, ha- this is happening in cannabis. Like the fight for home grow is not over in cannabis. Like you'd think that we would have gotten to the point where it's like, well, if cannabis is okay and legal, then like we should be able to grow it at home. It's not that simple. Like big companies are really fighting against it. There was a, there was a governor like, a, a week a week ago, I wish I could remember like which state it was, but governor was like, if you allow people to grow cannabis at home, like it'll like it'll be like kids will die or something like really dramatic, wow. you know, like yeah. so dramatic. And it, you know, people responded unsurprisingly hilariously, like yes, in every state where they've legalized cannabis, there are no children anymore. Like <laughs> what's funny is that, you know, legalizing cannabis, like you know which group increased use the most after they legalized cannabis? Probably seniors. Sixty five and up. Yeah. 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 Teen use decreased, like youth use decreased in most places. Like it's just like ridiculous to think that because there's more access, people will do it more. I get why people think that that's the case, but they forget that there's all these other safeguards. And as Dr. Carl Hart has been talking about in a lot of his public appearances over the last few weeks, Definitely like feel, everything yeah. that's true about that people are worried about happening with psychedelics or with any drug are already happening with alcohol and society does a terrible job of managing it. <laughs> but alcohol also has a lot of free reign. It is true that over the last 20 years, alcohol advertising has been reduced a lot. Yeah. But like, I was just talking to someone about how like this line, uh, you know, the line that they're allowed to put to like balance out the harms is drink responsibly. It starts with the word drink. <laughs> yeah, like do right. still saying do it, right. just yeah. do it responsibly. And I think like we're saying like I wouldn't even say like you should do. So I wouldn't tell. Yeah, them. I rarely do. tell someone you got to do psychedelics. I'm like you got to do some research to figure out if this is something that you're trying to you know experience. But yeah. like that is for you to decide. That is not something for a company to tell you. That is not something for a doctor to tell yeah. you. Like you got to be like, am I wanting to have this experience? And to know what the experience is, you have to actually have the education and the context to know like what it does. And for better or for worse, you can't not have had the experience. You know, like I see that for a lot of people, it's like a it's like a shifting point. Totally. Yeah, I feel like that's so much of what our society is trying to subconsciously train us to do is look outside of ourselves for the answers. Exactly. Everything outside of us tells us what we should put in our bodies, how we should handle our consciousness. And so much of our work here at the Psychedelic Society is that personal agency and empowerment. Right. Like we're not here to tell people or try to convince people that they should be using these substances. We're not going to be like knocking on people's doors, yeah. being psychedelic evangelists. Yeah, but, please. you know, we're here to <laughs> we're here to serve people that have you know finding that calling and um just speaking of that calling yeah. what do you think about the quote when you get the answer hang up the phone i love that quote <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones actually um now what i don't think is that there's just one answer so you don't get the answer once and then hang up the phone and never pick it up again i think that there's a lot of answers but it's funny every time i've like gone into like a psychedelic experience with an intention and a question i come out with more questions mm-hmm. it's not that i come out with an answer where i'm like oh my subconscious is knowing all along no, he gives me more questions and be like, well, to know this answer, these are the kinds of things I need to do. This is like how I get to that point where I feel confident in knowing my answer. I love that quote, actually. I think it's a really, um, I think it's a really good idea and really good concept that really helps people. And it really helps people avoid the like, um, like chasing of peak experiences, which I feel like I see a lot. And like, as much as I'm, this is a little bit of a tangent, but as much as I'm like grateful that like culture around DMT specifically is changing, I've noticed like, 5-MeO-DMT is a particularly interesting one because it really like induces peak experiences, which I think ends up like allowing people to like chase peak experiences without doing integration, without having the space to actually do the deep work that they might need to get to that point. Um, And it's nothing about that's wrong about the medicine itself, but like it's a good example of like how I think the narrative around what it is that you're supposed to get out of an experience 
like can kind of overcome like the culture around it. Um, and I'm glad there's more visibility to like the sustainability and all these questions. And I think that like, there's just um, more to it than like the obliteration of ego that is possible. Yes. Um, and I think like, you know, we talk about microdosing or we talk about like, you know, five grams in silent darkness. I think that there's a whole spectrum of like what, um, like what is possible um, or, you know, let's say 30 grams in silent darkness. I don't know, like blessings to Kalindi's memory, you know? Um, so I think that like, like just having a um having a sense of like when when you need to hang up the phone for a bit and maybe you need to listen to a dial tone mm -hmm. for a few minutes before you uh, or maybe a few years even a few months few years before you actually start asking you questions again yeah and just being mindful of like three-way calls five-way calls <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. be mindful when someone's listening into your call yeah. <laughs> nsa or whatever like you know like when be, be mindful when like the spiritual fbi ooh, i don't like that concept actually be mindful when there's other when there's other voices <laughs> in there you know there are other other characters and i think this is also kind of a, a whole rabbit hole but i think a lot of people when they first start engaging with like esoteric or kind of non-ordinary states of consciousness they make the, they, they kind of like, once they start hearing things, and I don't mean just like hearing voices, but I kind of mean hearing voices when they start hearing downloads and getting information. Um, uh, a lot of people also like listen to that uncritically and they don't filter that through like a grounded reality of their consciousness where they just assume it's their ancestors or assume it's God talking to them or assume it's Jesus. Or the mushrooms. Or the mushrooms. Yeah. Like actually there's a lot of ways that our minds and our spirits and the entities around us like communicate and like you actually still have to have discernment. Right. You actually, you can't lose that discernment. And I think that this is actually a really interesting thing around like what kind of experiences people are seeking and why a guide or why a facilitator is helpful. Because sometimes like that's where it can be. And I don't think everyone needs to have a facilitator every time. I'm not a purist in that sense. I think that there are, you know, there is room for personal exploration and unfacilitated growth and so on. Um, but I do think that there's something to be said for like, uh, discernment around like what it is, what it is that you're what information you're getting and then like this to me is part of like cultural integration it's not just integrating yeah. your downloads into your narrative it's actually like how are the things that you're learning like able to be integrated into your reality and how can they actually benefit yourself your community your family and so on yeah. um, which is more of like this cultural integration question which is related to but not exactly the same as like the personal meaning making that we kind of talk about when we think about integration well, I think it, it really does. It is really related. Though. It's like the, the ripple effect. It's very related. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, I think for Danielle and myself, both like the psychedelic society, thousands of hours of work, like so many relationships, all these things. This is integration, you know, like my experience and my process. And it sounds like for you, your work too. You're like, you know, you, you're always left with more questions. Totally. What do you do every day? Totally. You answer questions. Totally. Like you figure it, you know, learning, slowly building this narrative, putting it together. Totally. And, and uh, not doing it by ourselves. Yeah, I feel like my job is not to have answers as much as I wish I could just say that. Yeah. Um, I really think that so much of like the work of like building out a policy framework for these substances is like hearing people and listening to the various perspectives that people have and the concerns that people have and figuring out like how do we um, shift away from current like toxic social dynamics with new structures and like be willing to like adapt and change as we go. Like I think any time whether it's policy, whether it's an ideology, anytime anything gets like calcified, you know, and lost in that sense, I think that there's a, um, that it, we lose an opportunity to do relationship building, to do different kinds of like growth and change. And I think that that's a big part of, um, sure, meaning, making meaning, but also like creating ripple effects that actually like benefit society instead of destroy it further, yeah. corrupt it further. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> well izzy thank you so much for your work thank you for who you are not only are you a guest on the, our first episode of the show but i'd like to consider you a, a dear friend in this space yeah. too and um it's just so such an honor to be able to live near you and be in community with you and, and get to receive all of your transmissions and downloads and guidance and and listen to the questions that you're asking yourselves and within your work it's an honor thank you i'm grateful to you i'm grateful to you both for like kind of keeping the spirit of the psychedelic society alive and not just like keeping it alive but like really bringing it forward into like this new paradigm that we're in i think that um this is going to be uh an inside job if you will get it inside because it all happens starting from the inside <laughs> but also really like i think that like our community and 
uh, maybe this is like maybe a good place to kind of like end or kind of like leave, which is that like people talk a lot about the psychedelic community. And uh, I think Dimitri Mugianis has said something along the lines like, well, you can't build a community just based on something that you consume. <laughs> like just because you consume something doesn't mean you're part of a community. Like, I'm not part of like the pasta community because I like, like whatever. <laughs> like, <Perfect. laughs> you know? yeah. um, so when I think when I say the psychedelic community, I'm actually thinking about people who are actually like putting their time and energy and love into the people who do use psychedelics, all of them. Um, make sure that can be done in a really safe and responsible way. So I honor you back um, for the work that you're doing within the community, both in the Bay Area and California and more broadly. Um, and yeah, as we move forward with this bill or with whatever happens like in the future, um, I hope that even if we don't always agree with each other about everything, like that we are able to move towards some sort of like right relationship with, with the earth, which eat with each other, with our families, with the substances with the people who have stewarded the substances, like I really feel like that's the direction we're going. And I'm grateful to be having these conversations and to be like diving into it with you guys. It's been a blast. Congratulations yeah. on watching your variety show. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun to put it together and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So uh, let's get back to our fun lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, man. Where can people find you? <laughs> Um, so I am available, uh, on Twitter and Instagram, uh, at ampersand, uh, sage underscore Izzy at sage Izzy, um, maps, uh, is available on Twitter and Instagram. I think it's at maps news, I think is our handle. Um, you can check out the psychedelic bar association at HTTPS colon slash slash the psychedelic bar.org. Um, and, um, I think that's probably good for now. That's like, that's like the best way to, to get a hold of me and to find me. And, um, I'll be, I'll be releasing, or I should say double blind will be publishing an article that I'm writing right now in the next couple of months, I think sometime in June, um, an article about that kind of goes into depth about this family stuff. It's going to be called, well, the working title is Islam Alaska. We'll see what it actually ends up being, <laughs> but it's kind of like to, goes into some of these questions we were talking about around family and spirituality. Yeah. Um, and I'm working with my friend Paula Graciela Khan on a chapter for a book that should be out at some point in the next year or two called um the, the book is called trigger warning um the chapter is kind of about an alternative history of the of the war on drugs and ways to think about drug use and consumption that kind of incorporate an alternative understanding of substances including sourcing the history uh, all of these pieces so i got some stuff coming out it's been a you know busy covid season i hope that you know in the near future we'll have to transition onto that too and like keep building the you know world that the beautiful world that our hearts know is possible or whatever it is that we're kind of go for yeah yeah, yeah. thank you